Is, is anybody here to speak to that? Well, then we will move on. Maybe doesn't but, go on. Huh? I mean... I, I can, can tell you too, but... Yeah, I would say, if we go ahead and... I don't think there's any reason to like push this off too much. No. I, I, I've been to a couple of meetings. I went to luncheon when they presented this. What, what it is is um, the people that own Mule Town Rec, the pool is where we've generally done our, uh, our, our swim teams have uh, participated, competed, trained, and now it's not available. They need money to uh, buy the supplies and everything to keep it open. They, they, they're, the owners are willing to do that, but uh, they're in a fundraising um, time that they need some money. I think they wanted to let us know just exactly what's going on and what the needs are. And um, Coach Creech is the um, is the swim team coach at Central High School, but we've got a swim team in all the schools, don't we? At, at Spring Hill, I think there's more than one. Isn't there? Are y'all saying anybody? Okay. And and there's really not an option if uh, you know for those teams, and so that's an important thing. Uh, did you have something you wanted to say about it? No. Uh, what they're asking for is three hundred and fifty thousand uh, dollars for the county buy-in. Okay. And they want us to give three hundred fifty thousand dollars. Right. Which you have to think of it as athletic facilities. Uh, you know, we we maintain facilities for every sport. Every school has it, and this is one that it's provided for several schools a place for them the, to compete and train and all that. Uh, but I don't have all the specifics of it, and perhaps if uh, Coach Creech, or you do, Chris, let's talk. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and school board members. So they are $350,000 away from reaching their goal, <clears throat> and there has been community individuals who have pitched ideas to Central High School and pitched ideas to others to see if Murray County Public Schools would be willing to chip in a portion of that money, not the full 350000 So that, as far as taking under consideration to allow SWIM to continue, that would just be part of the conversation and dialogue. But other than just preliminary conversations or meetings that have been held at First Farmers in various places, nothing concrete has been done other than I think Mule Town Rate may be looking to fundraise or... or tasking other entities to fundraise. But outside of that, I don't have much more information other than that, other than they were want, wanting Murray County Public Schools to bring that into consideration. Because what happens is if there is no pool, that could greatly impact our swim programs in the district. So. Okay, any, any, any questions or Mr. Moore? Uh, I guess I'll just state the obvious. I'm just not sure we're in a position to be giving money to a private entity. Uh, I just don't think that's something we can engage in right now. I mean, I, I hate this. I hate when you're reading through it. It seems like a difficult time. Obviously, I know over the last few years we've had some discussions about how difficult it is to find places to practice, to, to, to get teams together and make that work, but I just don't see how this is something we can, we can do. Okay, Mr. Beaver. I'm calling on you. I'm not going to forget you. <laughs> I'm going to call on you every time here. It's your last chance to speak. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, anybody else? I'm sorry, I won't be silly anymore. Hmm? Chad, excuse me. Mr. Howell. Real quick, what, what other facilities do we use here in the county that we don't own that we support? I know we pay a fee to Murray County Park to be able to use the football stadium there. Uh, I know we use some facilities sometimes at Columbia State that I don't believe we pay for or or, or maintain. And then I know we have donated land at um, EA Cox to the city, and they maintain it. So are there any other facilities that we use that we pay a fee for or that we help them maintain? Uh, golf courses. So either if we use Gray Mare or Stony Brook or Kings Creek, um, tennis courts, 
renting those facilities out through the city. Minimal fee, not much. Uh, the bowling alleys, they let us use those for free, no charge. Um, then, of course, in this case, using Mealtown Rec for swimming. We use Ridley Park for softball games and practices. I think that's about it. So other than the golf, the golf courses are privately owned, yep. the bowling alley is privately owned, of course, Mealtown Rec is privately owned. Do we pay a fee at Mealtown Rec for our students to use it? Yeah, we do pay a fee to utilize it, the the pool itself, but they're wanting us to. Uh, yeah, I understand. Yeah. I'm just trying to get trying to figure out. I mean, it's okay. a minimal fee. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Mr. And I just pulled up the email, and I just want to be clear because I don't want to misrepresent what they're asking. What they're asking is to do if we would be willing to cover a portion or all the cost. So I just wanted to make be clear about that. They're not asking just for all all of it. Any other discussion? Ms. Parker, I see yours. Or Mr. Fulbright. Go ahead. Okay. Um, do we know how much it costs if we were to use other facilities outside? Um, like if we were to, if, if our swim teams were to go to Marshall County to practice or to Williamson County to practice at a pool, buses, whatnot, do we have estimates on cost for that? We haven't run those specifics, but in the conversations that we had <clears throat> last year, two years ago, just trying to anticipate the possibilities. Basically, if we uh, and we can't use um, the one in Spring Hill just because I think it's it's run by a swim club. The only other one would be like in Marshall County, or I think um, Giles County has like a, but it's not inside, but it's an outdoor pool we would basically fizzle out our swim program. And that, that'll be, that's the next conversation. Like if swim can't happen or a pool is not viable in Murray County, then we're looking at prob probably cutting our swim programs more than likely, just because the numbers will be reduced so drastically, trying to get some, ki trying to get kids to Marshall County two or three days a week to practice. Mm -hmm. And then also where we would have meets at as well. So that's, that is the next conversation that we'll be looking at. Mr. Fulbright. Yeah, just two quick points. Uh, first one, is it would be nice if we could do this, but we also have art teachers begging for supplies to be able to run their classroom. I think it would be a little insulting to them. The other thing is I think we would be setting a very bad precedent because I know a year or two back, Stony Brook was looking either to be sold or looking for some financial help. And, you know, you may as well just assume that that would come next if we were to do something like this to help out a private entity uh, with their facilities. Because you said we use Stony Brook sometimes for golf. So I just think those are two things that, um, I mean, it sounds like we're all kind of on the same page with this, but that just would be a precedent I wouldn't want to get into. Okay, and I, I do agree, but I, it's regretful because I think the, the SWIM program has really been an excellent program. And, uh, but there just isn't any, isn't any other facilities in Murray County, so. Chair Cancer. Okay, Mr. Moore. Sorry, and I know not everybody has access to the email that he's talking about. I mean, just just to clarify, and this is, we're not talking about a large sum of money for to kind of get access. All they're asking for is a large sum of money to kind of save, buy some equipment to get the pool to a, a financially viable position. We would still have, I would assume, access fees that we would plan. There were some negotiations they were talking about. That was my issue. It's not that we would pay a fee. It's that we would potentially pay a large sum of money that six months from now the place could still shut down. I mean, that's the issue I have with that. It wouldn't be like we'd have some pay a large sum of money and definitely have access to it for the next four years. That'd be a kind of a different discussion, in my opinion. This is a little, little different. That's, I think, because not everybody has that on the agenda. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to move on. Budget amendments are next. And there are quite a few budget amendments, and Shipra has asked, and Doug have asked those people who really brought the budget amendments forth to be here to uh, answer any questions about them. Um, I have some, but I'll, I'll, any of you that want to, and I'll, let's just start with the first one and, and look, because I think that was the one I had, a que not a question about, but comment. It's uh, actually, and I was going to ask for 1005 to be removed, because I just noticed that the person who puts them on the agenda, she put that one on there, 1005 and 1009. So I'm just asking for the 1005 to be removed, because the 1009 is the duplicate of it, too, so. I think it's cross months. One was signed in July and one was signed in August between closing the books. And okay. She thought they were two separate ones, but they're not. All right. Um, 
but we could go further down okay. the line. Let, let's just start with that one. And that, Mr. Lindsay, would you let us know that there's a new state law about salary and overtime and, and all that well, concerning as that, the implication it would have in the future? Good afternoon, Madam Chair and Board. Actually, it's a federal law. Uh, starting in January, the threshold for earnings for a person to be eligible for overtime was lowered. And everybody in the HR department, well, except for myself and one other person, they're all now overtime eligible. And at the beginning of the school year for school system HR departments, that's like um, that's like our Super Bowl or our NASCAR or our playoffs. I mean, that is the busiest time of the year with all the transactions of people resigning, people being hired, and getting everything prepped for the contracts that will come out uh, in September. So we were literally working seven days a week, uh, probably for the last three weeks to almost a month. So this one employee who's right under that threshold of uh, being eligible for overtime made that much money in overtime. Uh, that may happen again next month uh, as we're preparing to get the contracts together. I'm not certain yet, but just because those laws have changed, it makes more people in our department eligible for over, overtime. Well, and it, it could add up over, over the long term. Uh, so I don't know whether we need to look at that and see if we need to make sure that it would be cheaper to put them in the threshold so that they're not in the threshold than it would be to have to, to pay overtime, I think. Yes, ironically enough, it would be cheaper to give those employees raises so they would not have to uh, work overtime because there are a lot of times where we will be working beyond the normal uh, 8 to 4.30 or 7.30 to, uh, to 4. So, yes, that is something to consider. Well, can can we look at that and, and let us know what, I mean, that would be an expense to do that, but I still think you're looking at a, in the long term, it would be financially better. Oh, absolutely it would. Okay. Um, you know, giving these employees a, a raise to get them beyond that threshold would be, uh, in the long run, better for the district. Okay, so I'm going to ask you to, to look at that and then bring that back to the next work session, okay? Yes, ma'am, we will do. All Thank right. you. All right, anyone, any other questions about that one? What about 1008? I've got one. I've got one. Okay, excuse me, Ms. Parker. I, I assume then you're wanting this to go on to consent. Is that what you're wanting? Don't have to. Okay. I would just say, I understand that maybe this time it slipped up on us, but I'm, I'm going to be very frank. I'm not going to approve overtime pay again. I, I wouldn't do that. I think that's a management issue, and I think we have to figure out how to get stuff done under, with the people that we have salaried that don't fall under that. And that may mean more time or delegating duties a different way, but I'm just – I have a real problem with not just managing the situation at this point or bringing us a solution. But I don't think saying, well, it might be the same next month, we might have more overtime at this point. You know it's there. I, I just I won't promise that I'm going to approve it next time. Mr. Hickman. Um, one of the things I'd like to bring up about that, and call it what you may, we've kind of talked about this before, is how we are so dreadfully understaffed in our HR department, which is causing a lot of this. Um, I think, you know, we would love not to work our employees overtime, and many of them would love not to work overtime. But, you know, looking forward, I hope we keep that as one of our solutions, is looking for more manpower, and possibly uh, that, well, not possibly, I know that could help alleviate a lot of this, but it is, like he said, the seasons for hiring, it, it, they have stacks upon stacks of applications. They have to get pushed through in a short amount of time. Mr. Beaver. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, during the shutdown, was these employees working 40 hours a week or were they still getting paid? 
at like other employees? Yes, yes we were. We were, uh, sometimes we were working in central office, sometimes we were working from home. The reason this is so pronounced now is because the run up to opening up schools um, magnified the shortage of employees we really have. I did not know that because I've not been here during a run up to the opening of schools, but uh, that kind of showed that we're really short when you compare us to a place like where our director came from, which is a similar size school system. They have about double the HR staff uh, that we do. So it's a real challenge to get what we need to get done uh, in that department. And then you gotta keep this in mind, your HR department, that's for your employees. If we're short staffed or we're working overtime, they're the ones that feel it because they can't get serviced uh, for things that they need quick enough and accurately enough. So your HR department's for your employees. Okay, thank you. Mr. Moore. Mr. Hickman, I know you, Chair Kinzer, had asked to send this back and kind of talk about pay. Are, are we looking at, kind of looking at the total department? I know we've had a couple of discussions now about the size and, and the whole, are we, do you have it on your plate that we're going to be talking about that as a board? And, and if so, when? Yes, sir. Uh, uh, I believe what we've talked about is bringing it in September. We had a lot on the agenda this time, so sure. I'll have those, uh, the, that and a couple other things we had talked about in okay. the September work session. We'll bring those up. That, that would, I guess, be my preference to actually look at this in the, in the whole picture rather than just one employee or, or addressing. I understand there's an issue here, and we, we probably need to address this because it's kind of already happened. but. Um, but similar to um, what Ms. Parker had said, I'm, I'm, I have trouble much past this. It, it really looks like more it needs something to be managed. I mean, I understand the first month it kind of shows up, uh, we're dealing with it, but it seems to me that it would be something that, from a staffing standpoint, figure out a way to manage that rather than just keep coming back. Uh, it, just, it just adds up. I, c I can only imagine we can't, as a, as a school system, have that happen in any other department. We would be flooded if, if that took place every month. And, you know, and, and we'll take some of the blame not to lay it on uh, Mr. Lindsay, but there were some procedural things that we have looked at that we can help change to alleviate a little bit of this. Um, one of the things, for example, to give you an example of some of the procedural things is we have a lot of, we have a, tra a, a never ending transfer date in this district. And so as soon as they post one, another, somebody will transfer into it within county. So they'll have to post it again and on and on. So we're going to be looking at that next summer, making a deadline for cutting that transfer off. And hopefully that will alleviate a little bit. So there's other things we're going to look at to also help with that as well. No other comments than you want me to? Yes, Ms. Parker. Well, I just want to say, if we're, I mean, if this were to come up again, it's not necessarily that I wouldn't approve the overtime that the employees have earned. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is I'm going to ask somebody to figure it out out of their budget. I'm not taking it out of fund balance. I mean, I think we've been very clear about how we spend fund balance and what we're gonna use it on. And this is something that just, we now know has to be managed. So let's manage it until we can figure out a solution long-term, I hope. But I don't have any objection to it being on consent All this right, that time. Was my question, okay. But I would never, I, I won't approve it again if it's coming out of fund balance. Understood. All right, then moving on, 1008. Any questions? This one's just opening purchase orders from last year um, that were not finished at June 30th for um, Eric's department. Okay. 10009, is that the one we took off? No. No, the 1005 oh. I took off because it right. matched 1009. Yeah, this one's not just not, yeah. moving line items to match the ePlan budget for the CARES Act grant. Okay, 10010. Let's see, 1010. Money for that's it again the that, that was e CARES Act money that we correct. moved. Uh, open purchase orders from the end of the year. Open. Those ones are actually all district wide. That we when we paid invoices in July, as we had items coming in July, we had a lot of technology items, books and stuff because not only did uh, the schools get affected by COVID and back order technology items, we also got affected by a lot of. Uh, the tornado stuff that happened in May. Usually all of our bookkeepers open all their p purchase orders by May 15th. And they had opened and ordered their stuff, but because tornadoes hit Nashville, a lot of their stuff got back ordered. So we had a lot of purchase orders that came through in July that were really for June. 
but because of the way we have to do our accounting, we cannot pay them back into the last year. We have to pay them on the date of delivery, and they were all delivered in July, so that's the purchase orders for all of those. Okay, thank you. Then 10012, these are three positions from CTE to regular instruction. Correct, and that's actually part of the cut. So when we approved the budget, the final budget that was approved um, the last day when we approved the budget to have 1.5 million in the books and we were supposed to cut a certain number of positions, these were the positions that were cut in CTE. However, they were not cut in the budget because Doug, when he, when y'all approved the budget that day, he just reduced the 116 line, which is just a regular instruction teacher's line, by the amount of funding that we needed to replace for the book. So this actually replaces that money in the 116 line because some of the cuts were made in the CTE department. Okay. Uh, and I'm sorry, I'm not looking for lights, but Mr. Hickman will hit me. Um, 10013, any questions? Let's see, 113. Capital Carry project. over from 2017-18. That's the remaining funds for that budget, okay. so they've just been carrying it every year. A big purchase order is open right now for the boiler at Spring Hill Elementary, and this is the remaining funds from that. Okay. Uh, 10014 is the uh, remaining amount for the mechatronics okay. grant. Um, 10015, also the remaining balance of athletic fields. Correct, that's this the is some of the money we allocated for. That's what's left as of June 30th to be put back into that line, so we're just putting those funds back. Okay. Um, 10016, funds received through the TDOE for Carl Perkins grant. Yeah, I don't know. Ms. Brown is here. Um, I had asked her to be here Ms. to Brown? address the Do you Dr. Brown. She's here. Okay. There's just a lot of budget amendments. It's good for us to know what's what. Is this, one this is your CTE. Carl Perkins Basic. That's basically we earn those grants. Can you? Sorry. Basically, we earn those grants through the state, and right now those lines are zero, and we're wanting to move that money in there so we can use it. Okay. That's yeah, that's all. Yeah, so that's both of budget. those budget amendments. I'm not real sure why they do a budget amendment on those yeah. because it's actually just a receiving money that I wrote the grant for and we it's a, it was approved. We we have to put it in the budget otherwise it would never be there. There you go. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's it's revenue that we've gotten. It wasn't. It's not part of the original right. budget. Right. Okay. Yep. So and one zero zero seventeen is that as well. Yeah, yes. one's the reserve and one's the basic. So okay. that's all yours. That's correct. One zero zero eighteen is budget. Um, BPK, I'm sorry, I don't know what that stands for, to match the, okay. I think it's okay. the same situation as Beverly, same as that. All right. Beverly and Cart Lori. Same. 10019, adding funds from the EIR grant to the budget. Again, this is a pre-K grant that we have um, through Vanderbilt and Metro, and this is bringing those funds into the budget so that we can um, spend those grant funds. Okay, thank you. Are there any questions on these? then I assume we'll put them all on consent, okay? Moving on, finance. And if you all have had a chance to look at it, the, month, the monthly financials at the end of the year, actually, financials, and I, it was a, a very pleasant surprise looking at the revenue that we've gotten for the year. Up, 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 by both on property tax and sales tax, even <coughs> June was up. So. Um, I don't know if any of you all have questions about it or discussion. Yes, Mr. Fulbright. I just have a question. When did the tax raise that was voted on go into effect? That It went into effect uh, in May. What so we that's reflected in June? June, correct. Is that what this county debt service fund, is that what that, that is? That's the amount for the debt service for that month. Okay. okay. So what we brought in from that then would be basically doubled because we only get half of that is that correct looking at the 376 number I would say so I'd have to go okay. back and look at my calculation this is a rough again, but yeah. I'm just trying to think through in my head how correct. it all works okay thank you that yep. helps excuse me looking at fund balance if you all have have had a chance to look at that you know that we are uh, we have we're adding a great deal more to fund balance than we did last year, which makes it a much healthier fund balance. And um, so having really swept 
you know, concerned at least about getting through the budget season and how we can do it. I think that, you know, we always need more, but at the same time, we're kind of, I'm kind of relieved that we're able to, our income was 107,000 as opposed to 107,000 million uh, as opposed to our budget was 103. So we actually spent 105 million and those figures are all there, but uh, that that's really uh, encouraging. Yeah, so pretty much the financials that you all see, they will stay about the same. Of course, it's not audited, so it could change a little bit because sometimes audit will come in and put some stuff back that they consider should have been put back. We do our best as far as our AP and AR staff, accounts receivable and accounts payable staff goes, and as far as property taxes go from the trustee's office, we've done all of our entries, so that's based off of that. We're closing the fiscal year this week. <clears throat> And they're going to audit probably, they've actually already been there last week, so they're pretty much ready for us to close. And if any of it changes, you will see it. So I know that Doug was here for the retreat for the board, and I had talked to him, and he stated that he had discussed some numbers already with you all as well. But if you all have any questions for me, I can answer. But we closed right now with $2.2 million in the surplus for the 141 fund. The 142 is a reimbursement fund. It never closes in a surplus because we're always waiting for the state to reimburse first for expenditures that we've already done. And the 143 fund did not do as great as it usually does just because we were not able to bring in as much revenue in the cafeteria fund as we usually are. So it closed with a deficit as well. And, and, it, and of course, the BEP funds, as he pointed out at the retreat, were down, which we, you know, I, I don't understand that. The sales tax is up, so I yeah, mean, you so just that, never that know. Kind of offset it, that's good. Any other comments or discussion <clears throat> about the financial. Thank you, Ms. Cox. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Um, moving on, a discussion of essential employees. Ms. Hopkins asked to put this on the agenda, so I'm going to call on you. Thank you. It really wasn't um, like I just, but anyway. Um, so I just was trying to make clarity on that, so parents could be um, kind of abreast to like just understanding. So with them being asymptomatic, asymptomatic, okay, of course we know that you could still be a carrier. So then after they've been around someone that has a positive case, then they're required to wear the mask 14 days. Yes. Okay. And then the, the testing part of it, after those persons um, – the others that were not the one that had it, that do they also go through the same testing or do they just, they just, it's left up to them, the teacher, the individual? The way the central employee works is, um, and there's been some confusion on it, and I've tried to um, dispel a lot of the misinformation and rumors. The, once the, an essential employee, they are someone, first of all, that's been contact traced to be within that six feet for 10 minutes. And I, I kind of want to give a little history of it, if that's okay. What we were finding was uh, some employees were disagreeing. Mm -hmm. I was not there. I was not in that time limit. And we started having some of those kind of problems. Because right now, the the way we find out that an employee is positive is through self-reporting. Then once they get the self-reporting, then the employee self-reports who is contact trace, which I have problems with that because um, you're making non-medical people make a medical judgment. So once they have, have that contact trace, those people they deem that they've been around, um, then that employee is asked, you know, at this point you can be a central employee. However, if you decide to come to work, you have to wear a mask and make sure you're social distance. At that point, we do not ask for them to go be tested. That is up to, to them. They must be asymptomatic and if they ever have any signs, they cannot come in. We've heard everything from, so if I'm COVID positive, I'm a central employee, I'm come in, no. You do not come in if you have COVID positive test. We also, one of the questions that was asked was, well, what if I have somebody at home that's COVID positive? Do I come in? 
It is our understanding right now that if you do have a spouse or child or anyone in your household that is considered COVID positive, that doctors are requiring the staff person to be quarantined that lives in that household. So therefore, once again, once the doctor gives that quarantine, we can't ask them to come in. We will not overrule a medical decision. We then released to the, uh, in our release to the, the principals, you know, if your staff member has any questions or doesn't feel comfortable, call HR. The reason we want them to call HR first is, is because we want the same message. We don't want one principal to say, this and another say that not saying they would but we just want to make sure we take out any kind of variability in what employees are being told myself and mr lindsay have talked pretty much if an employee does have has not been told to be quarantined and they do have someone at home they're to stay home if they don't feel comfortable coming in they stay home if they have a medical condition which they cannot wear a mask they stay home so there are many options for that employee if they don't feel comfortable coming or can't come in. What we were finding once again was many employees were in the argument, I think as Mr. Moore has asked several times, what do you do in dispute? And uh, some principals have actually went on the cameras and timed it out and found out if they were or not, but sometimes in the rooms we don't have cameras. So that's one situation where we can give that employee an opportunity to say, well, just come to work masked up if you feel that strongly about it. So those are some of the reasonings and some of the expectations and some of the guidelines that teachers have to be considered an essential employee. Thank you. That was some of my other question, but it, it cleared it up through there. Thank you very much. Well, I'm, I'm glad we had the discussion, though, because I think that was something a lot of people had questions about. So any, anyone else? All right, then moving on. Oh, excuse me, Ms. Parker. If a teacher is being deemed essential, uh, an essential employee, they're asymptomatic, they're wearing a mask, are you letting those students know that they've been potentially exposed or is that not being done? Right now, what we have, what we have done is taken the first step. I've been uh, in contact with Jake, Mr. Oliver, and we've, we've announced to parents when the, the full measure of it, which many districts have gone to the essential employee. We just knew the first step was we need to let our parents know that we are doing that, where some districts are not. Um, at this point, when we do have that, uh, we, we have yes and no. From this point forward, We've really, most of the cases that we've been seeing has been the positive and then, um, but that is a practice that we can do and we probably, we can begin to do as it happens. Right now it's very low numbers. Um, if I can, just had it pulled up. Really Murray County and the school systems, it's a very, very low number right now that we have. Here we go. We have a total of, as of this morning, and it changes, it can change and double tonight. We only have, uh, we have 16, I said 14. It was 16 employees that are COVID positive or with symptoms, because we count with symptoms as well. You don't have to have the test, but if you have the symptoms, we count that. And then we have 30 that were contact traced. And that's out of the 800 employees that we have, which is a very low number. And obviously, once again, that can change. Um, and it will. But most of our schools have zero positives and zero contact trace right now. OK, thank you. All right, I'm going to move on. And the next one, I also added this uh, discussion of nurses because I didn't think we were finished discussing that and so I've asked and I'm sorry I forgot your name yes to come up and tell us about the week and and talk about where we are
Thank you, Madam Chair and Board. Um, I'm the lead nurse for Murray County Schools. I'm Diane Alley. The beginning of school is always very busy because we have a lot of legally required paperwork as well as getting our treatments, the orders for our procedures, um, meeting with new parents, meeting with old parents to find out new treatments. This first week has been absolutely chaos. There is no way that the nurses can continue to go like we have this week between the parents calling, the staff calling, principals calling the nurses, trying to track who needs to be isolated and quarantined. And this person's been exposed to a grandmother and we're doing the health department's job. Yes, I realize that the health department is not doing it. So someone has to answer these questions and decide if these students need to be at school or not. We are on the phone four and five hours a day right now. We also have legally required procedures that we still have to do. We have IHPs, which is for, similar to an IEP, only it's for students who have health conditions. Those, again, are legally required and they have to be followed up through during the school year. This is not a once and done thing. This is something that will continue throughout the school year. Yes, there are a lot of students on remote. However, a lot of our students are special needs students. And even if schools close down, my understanding is a lot of our CDC classes will still be operating in the building. I know there's a concern that of paying the nurses if we aren't there, or if the students aren't there. We will still have, my understanding had been, that there will still be some of these special ed students in the building which is a lot of our time. That's a lot of our paperwork. That's a lot of our procedures. As we get students in the buildings that are testing COVID positive and we are having to get the contact tracing done, which most of our principals have, have told the nurses that it's gonna be up to us to do it. There is no possible, I mean, they talked about overtime. Our nurses are staying at school until four and five o'clock trying to get paperwork done. You know, teachers complain that they don't get duty-free lunch. We never get lunch. If we do, it is eating peanut butter and crackers in your car going between schools. We don't get a planning period. We don't get a 15-minute break. Most of the time, we don't get a bathroom break. If you do not have a student who is medically fragile or who has medical conditions, we didn't go to school with students who had these conditions. So we're not used to seeing this. Until I was in a school system, I had no idea the number of students that we have that are medically fragile. The health conditions that we have at school are unbelievable. We have children who have trachs that have to be suctioned. We have students with pacemakers, internal defibrillators, heart monitors. We have kids who have cancer who are coming to school. This is not something that's just COVID related. This is not something that's gonna end when COVID runs its course and there are vaccines and treatments. As more drug babies are born and as more preemies are saved, we are gonna have more and more students at schools with health needs. At the rate we're going right now, there is I don't know how, I truly do not know how we will be able to make it through this year on the staff that we have right now. And I know there's an issue of the funds, but if we can't do it, we just can't do it. There are only so many of us and so many hours in the day, and we just cannot meet the needs if they continue to grow with the COVID like we expect them to, and still meet the needs of our children with procedures. Ms. Alley, uh, Mr. Pointer brought two options to us, and then we also came up with a third option at the, at the board meeting last time. And I believe that was to use part-time nurses that wouldn't require benefits. Correct. Could that be considered temporary I mean could we do that for like a, just a semester and see if we get to this point uh, and another question 
um, what schools open up without a nurse there? How many schools? Well, we have 23 schools that open every day, and we have 13 full-time nurses, and then we have three part-time nurses that come in and work during the day. Um, we have to adjust their hours based on what time treatments need covered, and currently we have two out of maternity leave. So right now we are working with 11 full-time nurses and two part-time nurses. I'm sorry, 12 full-time nurses and two part-time. Mr. Fulbright. Are we looking to make some sort of motion for the meeting or kind of, I know we can't vote on anything now, but what are, what are, what's our I th I next think, move? I think I, I'm with you. I mean, usually we have something specific in mind, but I think maybe this is a time to discuss what we feel we're able to do or what, what would be best to do, and then we would have to vote on it. Uh, if you want all three options to be at the meeting, we can make a decision there. But I think that my concern is that we do nothing. Uh, I can't, and I understand all about the savings account and all that, but I don't know of anything more important than the savings account. Doing, doing nothing is not an option. No, it's not an option. So, um, um, I guess that's my question. I, I, I do want this to continue on for the full board meeting, and I would like to to vote on something at that uh, September meeting. Do we have to, we don't have to pinpoint one of these two tonight. We no, just, okay. uh -uh. We'll, we'll just have all uh, the, the three choices. Is that, is that, will that be our, and one of them you came up with as well, so. Well, um, and I, I'll just lay it out the way I'm kind of looking at it without really thinking it through, is we start with option two, and then as you guys put your budget together for the next school year, we move to option one. So that's what I'm gonna, probably advocate for unless I think of something different or better or convinced otherwise. And one of the things that we can do is something we talked about at Central Office and actually came from Mr. Lindsay was just making these nurses interim and then it would just be based on funding for the next year. And so any full-time or any part-time individual that we hire based on what the decision of the board will be, it will be under an interim status and it will just be pending whatever funding we have for next year. This is what I would suggest then. I, I think what we'd like to have on the board meeting is, is some kind of motion that can be, uh, I like what he said, that I, I think option two would be the best for my choice. I mean, I know everybody may have a different opinion. Uh, and then moving toward option one, but also the idea that you have an interim. We, you know, hopefully we're not gonna be living like this all the time. And if they're interim, then, you know, we may or may not need them or we'll, we'll can justify them, but we can, at least can make sure they're in the budget next year uh, as well. So uh, that's where I am. Do you have a, okay, excuse me, Mr. Moore. Right. So a couple of sides of this. Um, I, I guess the problem I had with the, the options one, two, and three, whatever they were, it, for any other department we have, we kind of don't approach it that way. I mean, I would, I would, I was wanting to see because um, there's two pieces here. There's obviously there's kind of the emergent situation. What's going on right now with COVID? Obviously, the first week has been taxing. I understand that. That's kind of a second piece. I'll talk about that in a minute. But but on the whole, I would really rather see a. I've been very nervous about the one nurse per school kind of guideline. I know that's an easy one to look at, but as as we keep hearing more about this, I'm not really sure that's really what our need is. And I guess as a board member, I would kind of like to know. What do you guys really feel like as the nursing department? What really meets the needs? Because I understand that we have some schools where that need is off the charts higher. It's really more than one nurse, if I'm understanding correctly. Yeah, and, and, and that's true. What we decided to do, because basically how it was pr proposed to us to bring it to the board, was try to find something that we could get started with and get done. Now, we okay. can go back and put specifically every need, the number of nurses that we need at every school. However... In reality, is that going to be realistic to pull those funds right now and uh, well, then I'm not put them into school? Right now, what I am looking for is like any other budget is what is the need? I mean, because that's kind of as a board member, that's kind of where I have to start. What is the actual need? Right, right. Now, if and we have to, it, just if if we have to cut back from that because of budgetary reasons or whatever else, that's that's what the decisions we make every day. I just really want to see in total if you guys put together what the actual need for the district is as far as nursing, I would like to see what that is. And if that is actually 32 nurses or 40 nurses, I don't know what that is. I really don't know. I'm just saying I would like to see that 
Because at that point, then it's on us. We can then say, if we can't do this, because you've told us what we need, and if we can't do it, we have to weigh that and decide what we can do. That's what I would like to start with. Now, to go to the other piece is is the kind of the emergency. I, I still don't understand why we haven't really looked at, at temporary bringing someone in from a staffing standpoint. Does that meet exact needs? No. Would it take a load off almost immediately of being able to have some nursing staff have a load off? I think that would have to help at least to get us through kind of this really unknown spot. And I, I'm still kind of was wondering why we haven't really looked at that part because this, you know, this process takes time regardless. I think we've talked it's going to be a couple of weeks before we could even get approved, get this funded, have a budget amendment done, go before the county commission, get funded, get the ads out, get some staffing. I mean, this is a kind of a longer process. I just, I, has any more? To my understanding and speaking with Mr. Gaines on looking at outside staffing agencies in the past, there have been challenges uh, um, with bringing staffing agency in and the cost factor with hourly rate. Therefore, that, that has been avoided in the past. Now, we can look at it and bring those numbers back to you, but in me speaking with him about what has been done in the past regarding staffing agencies, the district itself has avoided it, given trouble from the past at, at looking at it and assessing. I mean, I can understand that. I think we're in kind of novel times, uh, all things considered. Mr. Hick. I just wanted to kind of talk about what Mr. Gaines, because he and I talked in depth after you, Mr. Moore, asked us to look into some temp agencies. He said one of the big problems that they had is finding one that will come to the schools, and then once they found one, I think before, was they would not follow our school guidelines, which fall under a whole different criteria, so they had to dismiss the one that they got. Am I correct on that, Nurse Alley? We have had some agency nurses that have come in for particular students, and not only are they about 75 to $100 an hour for staffing, but school nursing is very different than hospital nursing or even home health nursing. So it's a very difficult transition a lot of times for those nurses to come into the school setting. The confidentiality is a lot different because you're in a classroom. Most of those have to do things like the tube feedings or the catheters. A lot of our tube feedings are done in classroom. Um, and there have just been, the time we've done it once before, and there were some issues with them going back and telling things that were happening in the room. And, and it was probably just a bad experience with that particular nurse. But since then, the cost of it has just been very prohibitive because it's very expensive. Mr. Howe. So with the contact tracing, how much time are you spending a day on contact tracing? We have I mean... Oh, yeah, I want, I, want, I, want, I want a nurse's we, perspective, not yours. I, well, Chris, I know you, but let me talk to her. I'm in it too. I got numbers for you, don't We had one nurse one day last week that spent from 8 o'clock in the morning until 4 o'clock in the afternoon doing nothing but talking with parents who had called in and said, my child's positive or my child was around this other student who is now telling me they're positive and how long do we need to keep that child out? And do I need to keep my other children out? There are so many questions around what needs to happen right now. The principals come to us and ask, what exactly am I supposed to do when this child comes in? We are considered the professional in this, and we are just getting bombarded, not only with people in the building, but with our parents calling us and just asking questions. So do we have to have a medical person actually doing the contact tracing or can we hire additional staff? You could have someone else do it. The problem is it's so hard to get people to understand. Right. You have to really understand the disease process and why we are quarantining the way we are quarantining and how to track that. Could someone be trained to do that? Yes. I'm just trying to figure there's a way we can take some of the burden, some of the burden off, off of you. I mean, you know, I mean, that's not 
Yeah, I mean, that's not what we right. need you doing. We need you attending to the need of our students, not contact tracing and doing paperwork. I mean, we, paperwork's part of it. Trust me, I know. <laughs> but we need you to do your job, not the paperwork part. So, but and I think just it's just there's, there are just so many questions about it since it is so new sure, sure. that it comes to us. Even if it goes to someone else first, then they come and ask us. Right. You know, this is the exact circumstance because there are so many variables from circumstance to circumstance, right. and they they're going okay. It's this is exactly how it happened. So what's the correct way and to answer this? So even when we try to get principals or other staff to answer, they end up it coming back, back to you us, anyways. and we end up answering it. Well, anyway. my hope was maybe you could filter some of it out to where you know one person's coming, but maybe not. To add to that, um, just from a numbers breakdown, in the first week, we got 123 kids in COVID protocol. We have, and then of those that are positive, we have roughly about 20 students that are positive with COVID. So four elementary, three middle, and 13 high school. And that's in just the first week. And so that's just trying to manage all of that. Um, even those that are potential, trying to manage that is, is also adding to it as well. Uh, Mr. Higman's talking without a mic, and he said, <laughs> he said that's I was just adding, and, you know, that's out of the 12,700 students. So, you know, it, it, we're, we've been very active in that. We got Mr. – you're next. Mr. Sims, is your light on? Yes. Okay. Um, well, hopefully as this goes on, parents and everyone will get – hopefully not a custom, but it, it won't be as hard. But – um with the I, I agree that we need more is this something i guess shifra that we can go to the county commission to get our budget amended so that next year it will be um we won't have to dig into a fund balance yearly correct you could put it in your budget request for next year and see if the county commission would approve it if you decided to increase staff with fund balance this year then you could ask for it to be replaced with property tax or increase or something but we can't go you cannot change property tax uh, allocation during the year it's once it's approved it's approved till next year well you could pull it from your fund balance and they would have to approve that amendment but that's the only way we could do it or cut budget somewhere so they can't alter our budget mid-year in any way not by giving you more revenue from what i know we can't out the property tax allocation is done based on pennies and the penny allocation is done in a resolution form and when the budget is passed and it's sent over to the state for the state to approve so what we was what was allocated to Murray County Public Schools through the pennies has already been allocated and sent, sent over. And but our revenue, with our Fulbright revenue... light is on, too. He might want to say I was something. thinking with our revenue has been over um, at the work session. That, that's why I'm, I'm bringing this up, because we discussed this at the work session with Doug. Um, my understanding... Just, I, from, from what I know, and Commissioner... Oh, Commissioner. Mr. Fulbright might correct me, but... Uh, I, you can't adjust the penny allocation during the year. No, and that's where it comes down to fund balance. I mean, it's just a fund yeah. balance issue. But I think I see what you're saying. We want to make sure that it gets into the budget for next year. Yeah. That's what yeah. we'll uh, keep telling I, I, I was just thinking that they yeah. could increase our budget, not allocate additional pennies to us. It's not but the pennies. It's the, sales, it's the sales tax. It's next the, we're not, we're not talking about property tax. Is the sales tax. Our sales tax revenue is going it's it's always up that's what's why we have a, a, a surplus every year right. it's not because we're cutting back it's because we're spending less it's because our sales tax revenue is coming in at a higher rate and what doug was saying is we could come back to the county commission sometime next year yeah and oh, ask for that <laughs> but let me say this I, I spoke to doug about this i was at a uh, financial management meeting and and met for just a little bit with Shepard and Doug, and I, I said something about the nurses, and I said, you know, I, I know that traditionally we don't like to spend fund balance, and, you know, commission doesn't look like that. But I said, Doug, I can't think of a better way than something that is really needed right now is the safety of our kids. And he said, absolutely. 
And he said, you, there's lots of ways you can do it. Next year, you put it in your budget if you want to keep those nurses, if we make them interim, not necessarily. But yes, you'd have to use fund balance right now. But once again, we have a surplus of two point something million. I, I can't remember the thing, which he's saying to us, why would you not do that? You know, why indeed, <clears throat> Mr. Fulbright? Yeah, I think I just want to make sure I'm understanding what you're asking. You're asking since we're having such a, we, and we do it on purpose every year, we underestimated the tax revenue coming in if we could adjust that mid-year. And that's not, we're not able to do that. That's what, that, because that's that, what I was. Yeah, that's a fix. And that's why I keep, that's why I sat here and kept telling Doug, are you sure that's as high as you can get it? Because I knew right. that we were going to have that. So, yeah, but no, we can't, can't adjust it like that. Um, Mr. Pointer, I want to ask for two things for the next meeting when I hope that we vote on this and pass something. I want to know what, what we've got at each of the schools right now. I'll say a list of schools and who, what nursing uh, folks are staffing those. And then right beside it, I make it look however you want to, don't listen to me, but right beside it, uh, I want to see what's needed at those schools. So if we got Withorn, we've got one, two, whoever, but we need three or four in a part time or, you know, I. Kind of that's the way I would like to see it broken down because I'm looking at option one and option two that you gave us at the last meeting, and these numbers are very thorough and very detailed, but I would like to see the breakdown per school. Um, and that would help me make a decision because, you know, 500,000 is an awfully big number, but if I can see how that matches up to the need that's being expressed, that's what I'd like to see. Kind of school, what's there, what's needed. And I think that would help me make a clearer decision. Thank you. Oh, excuse me, Ms. Hopkins. So I just want to say thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you um, for your work um, and, and trying to take care of the children. Um, and so but that was my thought. And, and like you said, you made a very valid point that even after COVID and things like that, the the needs and making the school runs and having the safety there and the care for all the, you know, uh, students is very important. And we realize we've been behind on that in time and trying to move up the, up the ladder. But the one thing I can think about too, um, that is just a reality as well, we're getting ready to not only this COVID season, but the flu is gonna just hit. And so then the work becomes double because they're gonna have to differentiate between is it COVID is it flu and then still treating flu and one thing that i know um hadn't worked pediatrics but um uh, my sister's a cvicu nurse and children are not like adults they can be well in five minutes and the next they could crash and so we need you know we need the proper things in place for those situations you know um to take place but i do i do i just thank you for you know what you're doing i thank you chris pointer i know you have some expertise from home uh, with your wife being an advanced practice nurse so um you know it's it's just a good thing so like you said we had to you know i can't think of any other thing because our mission is to make sure children are taken care of that's our number one thing the health and safety of our children their education as well but if they're not well they can't be educated and so uh, fund balance or so what do we have to do but we'll look at the options but our job is to try to help you get what you need so our children are taken care of. Thank you. And let me say thank you to all of you all. Not only have you been faithful even coming to see all the interviews and making your presence known, and, and certainly I know this week has been unbelievable, and we really do appreciate your service under these circumstances. We never hope to be in it, but we do appreciate it. So you're going to bring something back to us, and we'll uh, see what we can do. Excuse me. I'm sorry. Mr. Moore. Did we ever come up with a motion or what you're looking at? Okay. I, I just want to go back to one thing. I'm still uncomfortable. I guess let me. What I don't want to see is whatever we decide to do, if we decide to do something, that just becomes the de facto new budget for this department next year. Um, because I still feel like there's more. I know in past years we've talked about shuffling supplies around. I mean, get down to that level. What I'm really asking for, again, is I would like to, and I understand there's kind of two pieces. There's an emergency situation. We're trying to cover some needs now. But I would hope that when this comes around for budget next time, we have a, a more broad discussion on what the actual needs of that department is 
from supplies to whatever the actual needs are. I mean, it's really no different than what I've asked of the facilities department. Uh, how many maintenance people we do? And I don't ask what school they go to. I don't care. What I ask is the department head to bring us, we need this many maintenance people and this many trucks and this many, the, the, these supplies to be able to do our jobs. That's what I was looking for. I, I don't want to, and, and this is to be fair to you guys, what I don't want is to just, because I know you'll kind of come to us asking for more money and hoping you can get something because we've, we've been negligent in really addressing this for several years. What I don't want is just, well, we got this much and let's just make that work again. Because I would rather not have that discussion. I would rather, again, if we're going to turn you down on what you say you need, I want to be able as a board to look at the department in the face, so to speak, and say, you've asked for this. We can't do that, and here's why. But what I don't want is to ever show up and say, well, we really needed more. We just didn't ask for it, and we have no idea. And that's, what I, that's a position I don't want to be in. So I would hope if something comes back as a motion for the full meeting, that it's in the form of a one-time from fund balance, and it does not recur in any way. This is going to be wrapped up at the end of this year so that whatever is next is a whole new ball game. It does not come out of fund balance. It's actually budgeted for, and we have a fresh start from that. That's what I would like to see. I just want to say, too, I think Mr. Sims was kind of alluding to it. Part of this is an education piece with the commission because we know how much we get funding from the state for nurses, and I think you said it's like, what, like, for every 2,000 students, 3,000 students, one every 3,000 students. So this is us, we approved this motion saying to our commission and saying to our county that we are prioritizing this and we believe that that's important. I think, I, I think there's a belief that that is the case, but in order to make it a recurring thing so that we're not sitting here next year, one week into the school year after you guys have been overworked, trying to figure out how to solve this problem, we make sure that it we almost have an agreement on the front end with our commission that we're prioritizing this and we are going to need extra funds in our budget next year to make this happen. Um, I think that's the, the education piece that we've got to have. Excuse me. Well, then we will look at the figures that you're going to bring back to us and we'll, we'll hopefully um, be able to take care of whatever we need to at, at the meeting next month. Thank you so much. Ms. Kendall, I had a little thing. Doug, right. just, Doug just texted and said the commission did approve the book purchase, so we have that done. And then um, the $1.5 million for next year, they've already appropriated that for the books for next year. And then uh, the fund balance on the 141 fund, we did close for $2.28 million in the surplus on the 141. Mm -hmm. However, we are pulling 374000 already out of it for all the projects and the purchase orders. So technically, if you It'll count for that, it's $1.9 right. million. Dollars. Yeah. Okay. I just wanted to put that out there. Yeah, they, and you did mention that to me earlier. Yeah, so when I, we know. were talking at the, right. full commission, at the commission meeting. Okay, yeah. 1.9 surplus. Yeah. So. Okay. Any, I'm going to move on then. Uh, next is instruction, and this is at art teacher allocation. Um, that I brought up, brought to the last meeting and we need an opportunity to discuss it. Last year, we uh, our teachers met with Dr. Marzak and uh, Ms. Inc. met with them and uh, made their case for not having supplies and, and we funded them. Uh, I'm not sure I agree with the breakdown after I saw the way they were, uh, and we left that up to them to decide on the breakdown. Um, I think they're only asking for the 48 thousand I think that's what it was and but I do think they they someone needs to decide how it's allocated I I, I I don't have those figures right in front of me but I think some of the smaller schools had huge amounts and and where you've got um, the bigger school yes Miss Kinzer I think that Mr. Gaines is planning to um, allocate this out like we do BEP funding on a per pupil basis this year so that it gets a bit more equitably distributed across the district. That makes sense to me then. Okay, so if we approve it, it will be allocated in that way. So is there any discussion? I would just kind of like to see a breakdown of that before I vote on it. Sure. Huh? I don't think that's very equitable to be honest with you. I've got a thousand students at Kalioka that get a thousand dollars, so Oh no 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 no! If you go to the if, no. you, if you go to the last page, there's a proposed distribution that's three dollars sixty-seven cents per pupil. 
Kalioka got a thousand dollars last year, they would be getting three thousand five hundred eighty-seven dollars this year. Yes, it's much more equitable. Because it looked like last year they got six thousand dollars of what we approved. So. That was how it. That, that was how it was sold. That that was how yes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But we left it in the hands of administration to we make did. that decision. So we did. Um, it it it. it Looking back on it, didn't look equitable to me, but whatever. But I, I do think the way that Mr. Gaines has proposed it is exactly what I was looking for the last meeting, honestly, okay. because I didn't want to see what happened last year happen again because I, I, I don't agree. think that was equitable. Yes, thank you. So can we put that on consent? Okay. Can I say one more thing? I'm going to say the no. same thing I said to the nursing. <laughs> I know they threw this number together last year and they kind of throw in the same number back at us again. I would really much prefer seeing kind of what they really need. I know they, I think this is another case of just like in the nursing situation, a, a, a round number was thrown out there to try to get something. I just would really prefer if the, I'd like to know if the art department needs 68,000 that they come and say, that's what we need. Um, I would prefer to see that. Because again, I think we, this is part of my bigger process of us getting, and I think it, what Ms. Parker brought up too, about really understanding what are the needs of the district so that we can go to our funding body and express that appropriately. I just think that's another piece of it. And I agree, and I, uh, you know, this wasn't included in the budget. It needs to be, right? It should have been. Um, if there's more needs, because, and I don't want to speak as an art teacher, not that I was one, but um, <laughs> When you're teaching AP art as opposed to elementary art, even though the elementary is so fun and so creative and I would say that the type of supplies you need for that are not as costly as what you need for an AP art or a high school art that has advanced courses. So that that's another part of it that I would be interested in going forward and let them come to us and, and try to, to put a, a realistic figure in the budget. I know that our when I taught, it cost $20,000 a year, about, around that number, to run that department. And we have fees. People, the kids paid fees, but that's, we'd have to raise money, apply for grants, do everything we could to put those supplies in their hands. And the, they're just not cheap. We use colored pencils that cost a dollar and a quarter a piece. So anyway, I won't belabor that, but I, I think, Mr. Moore, I think you're absolutely right. I think that, that it needs to be a more realistic need. but certainly Ms. Parker needs to speak next. Sorry. I will just say one other thing. While I think this is a more fair allocation, I don't, I agree with you, I don't think it's perfect in the sense that not everybody that's at Central is taking art. So we're calculating it based on a per pupil basis, but not every student at Central or Spring Hill is taking art or Whitthorn or what or whatnot. But I do think that we're not taking into account that certain programs are going to need more advanced materials if they're doing AP art or whatnot. So while this is, I think, better than what we did last year, I agree that there's still work to be done going forward if we want to get this to where it actually really, truly serves the needs of our students. Okay, thank you. I'm going to put it on consent, though, and we'll move on. The uh, continuous learning plan update, that's you, Mr. Hickman. Okay, we just wanted to give you some updates of how our CLP is going, what it looks like, and some updated numbers. As of now, um, we do have about 30% of our students without running today's numbers that we have 3,752. What we're finding is we're having a pretty good influx of ones that are wanting to come back into the traditional classroom. Um, however, what we've decided is we're talking to principals because we're scared that they've been set up for remote learners and we put that solid date down saying you can't go past it and it could really cause harm to the infrastructure of the classroom right now because it may put them over those numbers. Um, I do have a breakdown of the schools and it, like I said, it's right at 30% of our learners. But um, I do want to give a big um, thank you to Dr. Miller. This has been her full-time job, and I'm not talking about full-time job while 8 to 4. It's been, what, about 6 in the morning to about 10 at night? <laughs> and uh, 
yeah. So one thing we have done is we are in that medium level of our what we call an RCLP plan. And if we were all last week, we kept it open all last week longer. Today we did shut it down for a time because we had administratively get caught up. We do. We are going to look at possibly opening it up midweek to later in the week again. But we did need a time to just stop it, get caught up on our ad administration side so we can get uh, those kind of things taken care of. Another influx I've talked to principals that we're seeing that's causing this number to also go up. Uh, we've had several parents that were going, going to or planning on homeschooling decided that they were not, so they're choosing the option of coming back to remote. Um, at this time, I know I haven't talked about Mr. Seal. I was wanting him to share with you with our device numbers, how many we have in, how many we've got out, how many we have due out, and then um, Mr. Gaines asked to also, if we can look at maybe a number, I know it's not one we can complete this year, but, but how many are we short from going to one-to-one? -one? So um, with the continuation of leaving the application open for remote learners, um, we set the expectation with the principals and librarians to have the exact number of devices uh, by the middle to end of this week. Uh, we had four or five brought back to Whistorn today and two more go out, for example. So it's kind of hard for us to kind of get that exact number. I know Whistorn is the only school currently um, that we've had to deliver extra to uh, when it comes to devices. But you know, I, I'm, I'm not going to fib some kind of number and say that we've got you know 2,000 out there because honestly, uh, it, it's been fluctuating so much with coming in and out, like like Mr. Hickman just said. So um, I do know that we've still got about uh, right around right around 1,000 devices left from that 1,700 that we purchased from Dell that came in uh, to to get ready. But um, we've Tommy being the leader of of pushing everybody towards working on tickets this week. All last week we were working on devices to get those out uh, for, for testing purposes at some of the elementary and middle schools. Um, the rest of the, the, the next order, which was through ASUS, um, I got an update last Friday that we should have them by the end of next week. Now obviously we've still got a thousand sitting there that we're, we're working on trying to get through set up to be able to deliver to schools. So you know, I've, I've been telling people you know, the second week of September before we might even have those in the hands of students as well. Um, as far as uh, you know, those numbers, needing those numbers um, for those other schools, I think Cox is, is, is starting to ask for a couple more as well because they gave out all the ones they had uh, to remote owners, so they're the next ones on the list based off the numbers that they're giving us. Um, but we, I mean, it's just every day it's something different because again, like I said, we, we with Thorn had four return today and two gone, and then we had the same thing at, at Central where we had two that were you know, some kind of issues with them that they had to bring back and we had to, you know, s replace those so that they could get into uh, to, to work on those as well. So I'm not going to fib any number and, and tell you something until the end of the week, but I'll be more than happy to give that number to Mr. Hickman and, and he can send that on to you all. Now, as far as um, moving to the one-to-one -one number, uh, I still stand strong uh, towards that 1.1 that was mentioned when we first talked about the COP because uh, all of these that we purchased um, Dr. Brown and, and allowing us to move CTE devices around. Uh, we will only get currently based off the inventory numbers that I've been giving down to fourth grade one to one with devices. So that's you know K through three that those other ones that we we would need for. Um, and then teachers, um, you know, if, if we if we try to go the Apple route, you know, making sure they've got that just depending on what we do there, which has been the request from principals. So. Uh, you know, K-1-2 has been the request to, to ask for those, those iPads for the younger students. So um, now obviously that's the high end. Uh, we're talking through McDowell's got K-1-2 iPads. We've got uh, Randolph Howe, they're going to be K-1 iPads. Uh, so that we'll be able to remove those, but that 1.1 is the higher number. And I'll just, until we get them all in and distributed and, and seeing uh, where, where we're at with the, um, you know, older ones, we've still got uh, Key's budget Chromebooks that were purchased five years ago that kids are using, and and some of those are still in fairly good condition, but some of those are also the ones that's been brought back that we've had to had to replace. So um, I, I think with with using Dr. Brown's devices, we're going to get a lot further uh, where, than than we originally thought. But again, um, 
I'm, I'm not going to sit here and make up some numbers currently because, again, it's fluctuating. Any any questions to – excuse me, Mr. Howe. Refresh my memory. The ASUS, how many devices were that? Uh, 1133, actually. Okay. So and that in the 1700 Dells puts us at about 2800. Okay. And then, so just to clarify, to for the K3, we would need another 1.1 million dollars to. Yeah, I mean that's 4,000 devices. Uh, we uh, the 1700 was 400 thousand dollars that we spent on just the Chromebook. So that's you know if you you say a thousand kids a grade, uh, then that's 4,000 devices. So it's it's with insurance and all that it would be there. Now. It, you know, we go back, and I've mentioned to some of you during COP meetings and, and during uh, CARES Act meetings that we could possibly look at leasing the iPads on a three-year lease. Mm -hmm. And I presented that to the um, – in the uh, one of the plans that we presented before that we were looking at. It's kind of like a um, – uh, you, you pay for it, and then somebody gives you $100 back for it at, at the end of it. So it's, once they get to the third year, it's actually paying for itself, and I can give you more details on that. I've checked with Doug and Schiffer if we could even do that. And they said yes, but um, that might bring it down some more um, if, if we look at going that route. Uh, but it's essentially you, you get a B, a B grade. And, and even if we leave it in, cal in case, it's cases the entire three years, a B grade gets us uh, $90 back on a $300 iPad. It's essentially paid for itself come the third year. Um, but that's another way to get the number down if, if we really wanted to look at that. Um, no other, we don't have any kind of resi residual value with a Chromebook or a Windows device like that. Uh, it, that's only really with, with the Apple products. But just to throw that out there. We've, I personally, we've gone the leash route, and I don't think that's something I am have an appetite for. Um, we, Chris talked to us uh, a few months ago, and we actually talked to Audit. There is one TCA code out there that allows for us to do what he's saying, and it's only for educational technology. It's so specific, so he's really the only person who could do it. So we did. Um, when he emailed me, I was like, <laughs> "How's it?" Because he, he found out another county or city school was doing it. Mm -hmm. So I contacted our auditors and I said, "Somebody else is doing it, and they haven't gotten a finding." And I was like, "Not that I want to get them a finding, right. <laughs> but they did. They found a, our auditors found a TCA code, and they said they can actually do it. And only educational technology departments can do what he was saying." I was trying to get creative and find no, any way we could. I appreciate that. I appreciate <laughs> it. And it's not necessarily the, that aspect of it. It's the reoccurring fee that sometimes we, 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 we budget and then don't budget, and then we have to find that money. And the, if we just buy them, they're ours. Well, looking at it from a – And if we don't replace them every three years, we don't replace them every three years. But that's our option, whereas yeah. if we own it, we own it. We don't have to worry about that. I totally understand. I, just looking at it from a technology – you know, we've got 30 that SPED just gave us that no, they're bricks now. You know, they're just sitting there that if we had went something like this, we could have sold them four years ago and, and got the money worth because they're six-year-old iPads. So just let's try to get creative, and I'll share that and whenever. I, I appreciate that very much. Thank you. And just to finish out on the, the CLP update, we did get it returned. It was not approved, but it's simple things. We're going to be working on that, resubmitting it by the end of the week. And we don't see any problems once we resubmit it for it to get approved. What they do is they send it back, and each section had comments on it. And uh, there were simple things. And Bill Byford from the, uh, our region basically said, just make a comment here to tell what you want, and it should push through pretty easily. Okay. Any uh, – oh, Mr. Moore. Yeah. Can we transition to kind of talking about the whole reopening of school and how that's actually gone, or is that an appropriate time to bring this up? I know it's not on there, but you said we could conclude that under this. Okay. Could you kind of, uh, Mr. Hickman, could you give us a kind of a brief rundown of how it's, I know we're uh, a couple of days in, uh, a state of the system, I guess, so well, to speak. Well, <laughs> absolutely. Um, you know, sometimes I have to catch myself because I think I've heard it uh, lovingly called I'm in the ivory tower so I have made it m my priority to get out to every school while there's teachers in there and transitioned into getting to every school now where there's students in there and I have been to every school now and talked to teachers and the ones that I've been to since last Monday I keep hearing the reoccurring statement over and over that I can't believe how smooth everything went. And a lot of them are 
going back and pointing toward the the procedure plans they wrote and how when they were implemented how well it made things go I've heard principals say that over and over now most of the teachers will tell you they've worked they're working harder than they have ever worked in their teaching career and and you hear this but we're you hear this comment but we're teachers and you know we adjust and um, i'm just so proud of all the teachers and support staff in this district because it's gone smooth only because the time, the work, and the effort that they have all put into it. Um, you know, no major thing has came up at central office that I'm aware of. Uh, we do get questions from time to time, and, you know, we, we're very transparent to parents and to teachers and to the board members that do ask us. But so far, everything has gone really well. The thing that we're battling, as we were before school opened, things keep changing on us daily. Uh, we've had things change, you know, one of the big things that, you know, you keep seeing changed is, um, you know, some of the things with the remote learning. We're seeing some of the things change with now since, uh, like I said earlier, we're not the only district that is doing essential employees. You're seeing things change there. Um, you're, so we're just seeing a lot of that daily kind of things that change. And, you know, we are getting so used to it, it's just second nature. What changed today? Let's fix it. What changed today? Let's fix it. So overall, it's been a great transition, and uh, it's been all positive. And, and you guys are hearing a lot of it, too, on the board, so maybe you can speak to what you've heard. Thank you, Mr. Trickman. And, and I could echo that. I know from what I've heard um, from parents, uh, from students, uh, teachers, it's it's been impressive. I know there's a lot of variables for everybody, and I think one of the things I've heard from uh, uh, everyone the most was that there, everybody seems to be trying to give everybody a little bit of that grace we had talked about to understand that this is new. Um, I have been really impressed with teachers, to be honest. I know uh, uh, even the ones that are that were scared, uh, and understandably so, uh, still to a T have all dove in and still made it happen. Uh, and they're still trying to figure things out. I, you know, uh, as I've said, I've got a, my senior uh, that has chosen to do remote learning. Um, that has been, it's been interesting as I learn how to, to navigate that with him uh, and uh, understanding that, you know, his teachers are trying to figure these things out as well. So I, I, I have been really impressed uh, across multiple schools. Everyone I've talked to, uh, teachers, and teachers have been very thankful of parents uh, that have been given them some grace to understand that we're all trying to figure this out. Um, I've heard that car lines and, and uh, other things like that have gone, all things considered, very well. And that, that listen, car line is, is probably one of the worst things on the planet on a good year. Um, so I know that's a difficult thing to navigate, especially for our, our new parents that maybe have kindergarten or they're trying to figure out car line for the first time ever. Um, but I, I've been very impressed by our district across the board. Uh, so th that said, too, uh, what, if I can talk about remote learning for a second, what mechanisms, again, this is new for everybody, do we have in place as a district, and I talked about this in, in previous meetings, about getting information back to central office, back to the principals, and all the way up the chain to us, when we, when those teachers that are on the ground doing this figure out things that either are or are not working. I know one of the issues that's come up immediately is the state requirement, for, I think the 25% face-to-face -face time, which has been, from what I understand, a challenge, uh, especially when you try to navigate where you're, you're in-class students with your remote students, trying to meet those requirements. Um, a, what kind of feedback is coming up? And then as a board, I know we've done this in the past, what kind of feedback should we be giving back to our legislators or to the state itself as a board saying, hey, you need to adjust some of these things. You've got it wrong. Because I'm more than happy as a board for us to do a letter or contact them and do what we need, whatever whatever advocacy we need to do to let them know that they've just dropped the ball on certain things. And I feel like we're kind of starting to get to the point where maybe we should be letting them know what they've gotten wrong. So if you could give some feedback on that. I know there's like 42 questions. All right, number one. <laughs> no, you know, one of the big things that we're finding that's going to be proving really difficult is, like you said, is the interface time, the 25 and 50. You know, when, when the state, I think, did this, they were thinking everybody had a computer in their hand. And we're finding with elementary, 
that they don't have a computer, all of them don't have, or even have access to Internet or Wi-Fi or cell service. So that's been very problematic. I know I've heard from a lot of the teachers. Um, you know, one of the, the problems that's reoccurring, and I'll own this one, is, you, you know, we pivoted in how we were going to do remote learning. Um, the, what we, we, the principals started asking, they didn't want us to cover down, didn't want us to pick the teachers. So we started hearing one after another on teacher, the principals saying, hey, let our teachers handle it. We want to handle our kids in our school, which we think was a brilliant idea because, you know, these kids are going to come back to your school anyway. And, you know, the only guidelines we gave principals, and we were very clear about it, was make sure, you know, one, that you're equitable how you do this. And then, two, make sure that your teacher that you ask to do it is on board. And we were very clear about those two things. And I think some, some of that message did get lost, so that I'll own that one with the teachers, and I apologize to them. Um, and I'll let Dr. Miller talk about because she has had her hands so deep into this and uh, she can talk about some of the things that she's seen, some of the things she would recommend and and she's got that on ground level look. So Dr. Miller. Number one, I want to applaud all the teachers for just embracing this and being open and willing to put their best foot forward to meet the needs of our kids. It's not been um, a smooth and easy process. Um, it, we certainly still have our challenges, most especially in K3, K4, where we're having to do work packets and videos and the turnaround time of getting copies to schools so that they can get those packets out to parents and all those things. We're hoping that that will get better as we go if we can get a two-week lead or things like that so that we're not facing a deadline every time we turn around. But the teachers have been amazing. Um, those teachers who are 100% remote, shouldering the burden of creating the videos and the work packets for the teachers that are doing both face-to-face -face and remote learners in the elementary school has been phenomenal. And those, those teachers that are doing both sincerely appreciate that. Um, at the high school level, the challenges that we faced have been, I can't log in, I can't, class link's not working, or my, I'm not in um, Edgenuity or something like that. Those are little things that we are working on. Um, Miss Willie is um, constantly troubleshooting technology. She told me more than once that she's learned more technology in the last um, two weeks than she's learned in her entire life. And um, we've definitely, had our issues, but I think thing, we're hoping that things will continue to kind of slow down. Our response time is challenging because there is sh me and her working on this, she and I working on this. And so getting back to people in a timely manner has been kind of a, an issue, but we're trying to make sure that we get that done on a daily basis as much as possible. I know I told Mr. Hickman this morning that this afternoon my, my emails and my phone calls kind of settled down a little bit, so I'm hoping things are beginning, I, I shouldn't say that, but um, uh, but I know Miss Willie was, was still working when I left calling parents back. Um, so it, those are things that we're gonna have to deal with, um, but we do think that over time that that will get better. Um, but all in all, um, we'll see how the first video production goes this week. Chris is gonna come give me lessons on YouTube um, so that we can get that up and running. Um, but I, I'm thoroughly impressed with the work of our teachers and their dedication and the wonderful response our parents have given us. I mean, they have been amazing at saying, we know this is challenging, we know this is difficult. Um, just the grace that they've shown us has been greatly appreciated. So I, I do commend both parents and teachers and administrators um, for all the work that they've done to help us um, through this process. I would say this, it's really been a team effort. I, I really, the, Mr. Hickman comes in, you all came together, you had to come up with the plan, then you had to implement the plan, and the teachers had to do it. I, 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 I can tell you that Monday being, it's always a sad day that I'm retired on the first day of school, and I wasn't real sad about that Monday, but um, I did think about the teachers, and I worried about it, and um, before the end of the day, I started hearing from colleagues. This is the best day. This is the best opening day I've ever had. 
I heard from one colleague who wasn't going to complete the year because they're pregnant, and they said all of my kids had a mask on. She didn't ask them to, but they knew she was pregnant. Every one of them had a mask and has worn a mask every day since. Um, another comment I got was, and maybe that was from Charlie that was at a school, but when they were in the hall, if a child didn't have a mask on, they were saying, please put your mask on. We want to have school. <laughs> You know, if you wear your mask, we can have ball games, we can have graduation, we can do all these things. So I, I thought that was another sort of school spirit thing that was impressive. But I do, I do compliment all of you all the way through uh, for pulling this off so far. <laughs> okay, thanks. Uh, I'm going to move on, I guess. Uh, next is, oh my goodness, it's Mr. Perryman here. I'm going to let, let you take us through all this, okay? Well, the first two things that you see there, the train report and the project cost report, are just FYIs for you. They're the things you get every month. Just one note, Mr. Hall and I met with train last week. We are looking into the possibility of another um, low-interest payback-type uh, uh, loan where we could update our lighting outside of our buildings. One of the biggest... Uh, concerns we get as basketball season starts, as football season starts, are our parking lots, uh, the lighting around the building. We get it from the CPD. We get it from, from the county. Oftentimes, and we're looking at a program where we may be able to convert everything over to LED lighting that we can control directionally uh, and kind of, kind of better serve our outside. So we're working on that. Beyond that, we've just got the projects that we're finishing up, and we've given you an, an update as to where those stand. Um, the bid that we have there for you tonight is the fire alarm. It's a change order on the Santa Fe um, project. We brought the Santa Fe project to you, and it, and it was bid out. We did bid it out, and from the specs that the fire marshal approved at the bid to when they actually walked it when it was completed, um, they changed um, kind of some standards on us on what we have to have. We've got some pool stations and things that had to be added in addition, and that's about a, uh, is it $3,200? $3,800. $3,800 that just was above and beyond that bid. It was through no fault of the district. It was through no fault of the vendor. Uh, it was just a change that the fire marshal said. So we're asking for just a change order on that to come out of our capital money and to pay that. Any discussion? Then we'll move that to consent. The next thing there um, are the items that you ask us to bring you concerning McDowell Elementary. Mm -hmm. We are short one item, and I emailed Ms. Kinzer about that on Friday. Mr. Gaines was still out today. Uh, Ms. Parker, I think you asked for a cost analysis on what it would look like savings-wise if we closed that, that facility. And I have numbers on the operational side, but we would get into – uh, the instructional side as far as personnel, as far as what title might look like, those kinds of things. And I didn't want to give you uh, an incomplete look at those numbers. Our plan is for me to get with him, and by the time the well before the board meeting uh, rolls around next month, that we would be able to present you th that document so that you could see that. But what I gave you, uh, I believe Mr. Moore asked for a timeline uh, if we move forward one way or the other, and I tried to give you both a timeline if you chose to, to continue usage at that site, and a timeline if you chose to discontinue usage at that site. Um, the capacity numbers, Mr. Fulbright, that was what you had asked for. I based this off of last Tuesday. We came Monday, Tuesday was not there, and that sheet has been updated in two ways. One, it is all formula driven, uh, and two, except for the, the percentages. We, we didn't like how it did that, uh, so they are hand entered. And then we also, from when we talked to you in the spring, have gone back through conversations with principals, through conversation within our department, and going back to Dr. Register's report, looked at the capacities of the building, and we feel like those capacities are more realistic than the numbers that we brought to you in the spring. Remember, the ones we brought to you in the spring were just simply the ones that Dr. Register had given us based off of square footage. This takes into account on that sheet, um, the usage of the building, different types of labs, different types of things that have been converted that don't necessarily hold a class every day. So that, and then um, also we just included for you the EMG report that you were given last month, and that's the specific one for McDowell. Um, but we will get that um, cost analysis report completed and given to you.
um, you know, I think the time has come that we've got to make a decision. Uh, thank you for all this information. But I, I think that we've, we've used this term before, kick the can, but, but it's, really, it's really about what a school that we're not going to have the funds to replace, not anytime soon. And I think it's only right that we make a decision about McDowell soon. And so I think that decision needs to be at the September board meeting or maybe the next one since we do have some uh, new board members on board. Uh, maybe we can get more information if you need it. But I think we've talked about it. Um, I, think, I think it's time for us to make some kind of decision. Is there any other thoughts? Mr. Moore. Since I stepped away for a moment, I'm assuming we're talking about McDowell now. Okay. And the timeline here, and I would agree with you, I, I'm, I'm satisfied with um, us going ahead and, and talking about this at the next full board meeting as far as make what, what I, the question I've got is what format do we need to have some kind of decision in? Uh, and this may be a Jake question. Uh, what kind of, how do you go about talking about closing a school in formal terms? Well, I, th that being a given, I appreciate that. Uh, but, but I mean, honestly, what I would what I would ask for is that if that's what we're going to be talking about at the next meeting, I would like to have some kind of motion that that addresses it in whatever way we feel like is necessary. I'm not even, I, I don't even know what that's supposed to look like. I mean, it would it would be a motion to uh, first to. A motion that you were looking in that direction and asking for more information and a plan to close the school, and then it would be a motion to approve the plan to close the school. And that, that That's what I foresee. It would be a, a two-part process. Uh, that way you would have uh, the opportunity for public comment on both, both parts. And just so you all know, I don't know if you each took time to look at that timeline that you asked for. I tried to build that type of timing in so that there was a time for the public to come. And what I gave you as far as the recommended deadlines were, were like the most conservative deadlines. You know, a decision by Christmas, obviously if you do a decision in September or October, we can accelerate on our side getting more information to you and completing a plan. Um, but I tried to, to kind of take into those things into uh, mind. And then also from when we did zoning last time, if, if you do choose to close the site and we have to visit zoning, I tried to build time in for the things that you did last time, which were public delegations, and to make sure that we actually get that out to everybody and see that. So I tried to be real conservative with that with that timeline to allow you that process. I appreciate that. And, and that was, I guess, my next question would have been, like, was the, it seemed very conservative on the time. I know ideally, so two things on this. I'm not sure much more public discussion needs to take place on this. I mean, we really are not at a place where we have any other options unless there's some uh, benefactor in, in the community that wants to, sh to write a check. At this point, I think that's where we're at. Well, I will say that is my thought process. However, I did not want to speak I, I, for I you guys. I appreciate you so not going there. But for me, I, that I'm satisfied that if, if a motion were to be on the agenda for the next meeting that says motion prepare a, a school closing plan, if that sounds appropriate, and then um, and then perhaps have something quicker. Because I know ideally I would like for us to be able to put out to the community at least in January what this is going to look like for those new school years. And I know when we went through TSBA uh, training for years, they've always said if you can do rezoning in that and have that to the public in January so that they have lots of time to digest which, what frankly is not a, a pretty thing to consider what you're going to be changing schools, but it's enough time to prepare yourself for what's coming. Um, and I think January is the time frame. I know I would like to have that go out to the public if that's possible. I know that I don't know what other board members think, but I, I really want to give the public as much time as possible on the on the, the real part of this, which is not trying to figure out a way to make this happen, which we've been trying for years, but really to figure out what are you going to happen when your kid has got to go to a new school. I think that gives you plenty of time to figure out the logistics for us to figure it out, uh, for parents to talk to their kids about what this really is. I mean, I think that's a big part, too, is, is just have plenty of time to do that and not be throwing that at them at the last minute. Um, to say, you know, say goodbyes to kids that they may not be in the school with next year. That, I want plenty of time for that. And, and I will say, and I mentioned to you last month, that, that I was tasked last fall with creating a plan 
um, the, the beginning plan of what that would look like. So if you accelerate this process, we, we have the map ready. Okay. We just have to do go back and vet some numbers and make sure that from last year to this year numbers you know, they usually run somewhat consistent, okay. but we do some see some minor changes. So we can speed up or slow down to your liking, uh, and that's what I tried to, to let you know in that timeline uh, to give you that option. If you continue using, if you discontinue using, we, we can do whatever, mm -hmm. and we can do it relatively quickly, um, as quickly as you would want it. Right. Chair, if I could ask, I mean, if that would be my ask, is to have a motion to prepare a plan for closing McDowell School. Hey, I'm not calling Mr. Beaver just a minute, but let me say this. You've got a brand, you've got three new pe members of the board. You're asking them to make a big decision that we spent the last three years here in public comment about. I think that prepare a motion, yes, a plan, but the actual plan I would rather vote on in October. Just because um, right. it would give them an opportunity for public comment. I'm just I'm going to disagree completely. I think we need to keep moving on this. I just don't. We happens every two years. We put new people on. They come on and off. I think the people that are coming on have, have time to look at the documents, figure out what's going on. Uh, again, all we're doing is would be voting on a preparing a plan. The actual plan would come on with those new board members. Uh, that's not. We're not asking for the plan to show up at the next meeting. Um, so I think they would have plenty of time to decide what to do with that. You heard me say it's time to do it. I, I do agree that we need to. I'm just trying to. Uh, make sure we're giving everybody a chance to, to be heard. Mr. Beaver. Thank you, ma'am. Well, I'll tell you all what. I came on the board eight years ago, and I think Mr. Lindsey, he, he was, can verify this, but the second board meeting we attended, it was to talk about McDowell. We went to McDowell, toured everything, the bats, bat droppings, the asbestos, everything, and that was eight years ago. And I'm glad, hopefully, to see something come of this. You know, we had a lady come and talk to us uh, about a month ago, and uh, what I understood her to say, you know, you know, don't, don't try to make me feel good. Tell 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 me the truth. If you're gonna shut it down, tell me you're gonna shut it down. Where that that the citizens and the kids can make plans, and and you know, uh, I'm glad to hear this because you know we uh, this ball this can has been kicked down the road for eight years now or more. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. Well, it will be on the agenda. Oh, excuse me, Ms. Hopkins. Um, I just want to say that I think when we, um, since this is a sensitive topic, I think when we say things, um, we don't mean it, I don't think, in a funny way, but when we have humor behind the things that we say about that school, I've gotten thought that it's offensive to some of the parents and, and students that have endured that school. So it's not a can, it's a school, it's you know, it's it's children there, it's people there, and when we snicker, sometimes we don't, we not, you may not mean it in that way, but if your child went there, or you were a teacher there, it would it would cause you to think about how you say things and make sure you said it where it's not not harmful to somebody um, that that they've um, endured and stayed there and done well with what they have. The next thing is to Mr. Perryman. Um, it was a question that came up at uh, one time when they had the public delegations and some community members were wanting to know. And so I wanted to ask you, what is your thoughts or expertise on this school being um, the rezoning area where all the kids could maybe come together and come to this school, um, if that's even a viable option? Or, because I know the, the, the school that's here as well, but just your thoughts on that or discussion you've had for this school to be come, not now, but in that 2021 year, if that was ever an option, could it be an option? Mr. Gaines and I have talked uh, over the last few weeks since the last meeting about the East Hill Task Force that, that looked at this building specifically about four years ago. Um, he brought me the notes that he, he found uh, this last week. They are in a folder on my desk and they're about this thick. 
Uh, his, recollect his recollection was that it was about a $6 million process to retool this building, to reformat it to be an elementary school. Now, please don't hold me to that number. That's just discussion that he and I had. Um, but reprogramming it, the other issue that would come with that is we do not current, we, we do currently house two programs here. Uh, we would have to relocate them. This building presents many challenges. Um, this would be, um, you know, I mentioned to you that McDowell is the only school, school school, uh, that we have to unload on a street. Uh, if you bring big buses over here, we have to unload them on the street. Uh, some of the things that we, we've said are issues with McDowell, we would have to address here. Uh, car line here, I think might be a disaster. Um, and that's just an opinion watching car lines around 23 buildings. This, this building's not set up to where you could do that efficiently. Uh, if you look at the exterior of this building, um, what we just did at Santa Fe was have to go in and remove where windows had been boarded up. Uh, and what we found was that the air quality there had been greatly improved once we, we took those out and put windows in. If you look at the outside of this building, I don't know that you've noticed, but there are tons of windows that have been boarded up. So we have some major work if we were going to stay in this building long term as, as a, uh, like a functioning elementary school that would have to be done beyond the reprogramming. Um, we just gave maintenance directions to take this playground down because it does not meet standards and there's no one here that uses it. We're going to leave the swings, but we're taking the rest of it down we would have to retool this playground or as Mr. Gaines talked about, I think the East Hill Task Force talked about building a bridge across the street to, to be able to use the park. Then we have an issue with we are now fencing all of our playgrounds, how do you use a public park? Um, there are real issues there, uh, concerns, not to say, I mean, if you said we're going to do it, I mean, we, we could, we'd have to do it, but it's not the it's not as easy as just moving back into it. Um, but we can look at that if that's the board's will. I do have the folder. They did extensive work. I believe Mr. Pointer may have been on that task force as well um, when they looked at this as an elementary school. What this would do, though, is this doesn't solve the McDowell problem um, zoning-wise because those kids more than likely would not be zoned here. A lot of McDowell's kids live out uh, towards Bel Air on the Macedonia side back there. Those kids, the natural progression for them would be to move to Riverside, would be to move towards Baker, would be to move somewhere. So the kids that are here, around here, that this would be their natural zone for home would be Randolph Howell kids. Randolph Howell is our largest elementary school outside of Marvin Wright and it has the most seats available. So if you take these kids away from Randolph Howell, you open up seats at a school that already has a lot of open seats. So then you have to do a shift to where Riverside has to shift completely around. So now you're not taking the Riverside community to Riverside School. You're taking Riverside to Howell and you're bringing Bel Air and Macedonia to Riverside plus part of McDowell. The, the natural shift of it leaves holes within the zoning, but it is something that we could present to you as doable, but please note this sits right in the heart of the Randolph Howell zone. If you pull kids here, you do empty your largest space available. And then you just have a lot of seats at a really big school, and the placement of our schools aren't, isn't always wonderful. House that's out on Bear Creek Pike, it's going to be nice out there sooner or later because of so much that's building out there. But I know the whole time I was at Cox, you bust everybody out there. So it's kind of the same thing here. If you took these kids and brought them here, you're going to have to pull kids from the other side of town to send that direction. Actually, you would pull Riverside probably and send there. And the problem with that is you got a school in Riverside. So now you send kids to Riverside who don't live in Riverside. So that, that domino becomes, remember zone is all, zoning is all transportation. We have zones because of transportation, transportation zones. That's how that works. If you didn't have that, everybody could just go to whatever school they wanted to, but we can't transport to any school. 
so we set zones so that we can move students on buses. So we can look at that. I do have the folder. I'm not against it. I just know that for every pro we're going to see, there's going to be a real question. I think that's why the East Hill Task Force kind of just never really took an action. I think that's why they never said make this a school. I think that's why it never picked up the, the, the traction to move forward. But we'll be happy to do that if it's the desire of the board. Mr. Sam. Just a quick question. How, how many alternative students normally are housed here? I know Northfield, it says 25. Northfield and, and the alternative program, and Mr. Mr. Lang is here, fluctuate over the course of the year because please remember with the alternative program, uh, I know as, a, as being a, an administrator, the, the deeper you get into the year, kind of the more kids you get in this program. Uh, Northfield kind of works the same way. As you get kids who age up over the course of the year and this becomes an option for them, they can then choose to come to Northfield. They can work through his program. You have kids that, that start in a traditional setting at a high school and then they realize that's not working during the year. So their numbers fluctuate up and down. I, I don't know that I'm comfortable with saying, I know the, the the alternative school sometimes can get up to 50 to 70 kids. Uh, then what you do is look at Northfield, the same thing. But both of those programs, and actually schools, Northfield is a school, operate off of the traditional model. So you're not putting 25 kids into a classroom. Those 50 to 70 kids are spread out over the entire upstairs, and they travel in small groups. Um, we also house a skills program upstairs, which sometimes can have two to three kids and have three to four adults, depending on the needs of the kids. So, so and, and I would kind of take this to that capacity sheet. One thing I was going to say to you, not just about this site, but I gave you capacity numbers for each of our, our grade bands, for elementary, for, for middle, and for high. And they, they can be really tricky to look at because you can look at it and go, oh, we got lots of room. And, and in some cases we may, but what you get to looking at is the programming of the building and understanding that we say Central High School can hold 1,800 kids. We say we can put 1,800 kids in that building, but please remember CTE classes can only have 25 kids. Um, some classes that are, that are AP classes may have 18 kids that sign up for that class. So while we say that the building can hold 30 to 35 kids per room, there will never be a model in which we do that. If we get to 1,800 kids at Central, we're probably going to have to have a portable. So, so the illusion of numbers, just like this building is, you say, well, we've got this hole upstairs. It could hold a, it can't because of the programming. And that's the tricky part of it. Probably the truest of the grade bands to the program, seat to program numbers would be elementary uh, because it's so straightforward and traditional. Uh, still compared to middle and high. But, um, and I wanted to point that out, so I've kind of tied that together. Just be wary when you look at those seat numbers that sometimes they are a little bit of an illusion. So, so long answer, probably 50 to 70 upstairs. Northfield could, could fluctuate 25 to, to 35, 45, depending on the time of the year. Mr. Howe. Just to mention, to piggyback off of that, yeah, I, the capacity numbers, I agree. These are not accurate numbers. I can tell you there's probably three schools on here that I personally get, have been to and visited that if you're not putting another 100 or 200 kids in these schools because, you know, are you teaching them in closets is what you're really doing at that I, point. I will say I was at Cox when we had 1,050 kids, and we did. We taught in the weight room. We taught in closets. But it will hold 1,050 kids. It will physically hold it. It will do it. You um, can do it. We did it. But at 7, what, at 739, it's full right now, or, or close to being full. But, but we can do it because I was there when we did it. Right. Um, so I have some questions about, let's just say we look at these two properties, McDowell and this current property that we're in right now. Um, how do these schools, simil are they similarly sized? Currently? Yes. Okay. 
What about the property which they're owner? Are they similar size? No. McDowell property is larger. McDowell property is about seven, seven and a half acres, I think. Is that right, Dave? Something like that. This property um, is maybe four. So I going would say. so going forward, if we were to say, Oh, we we'll close McDowell and surplus that property or whatever and then move kids here, there's no way we could ever build anything here while we house kids. No, and this, furthermore, this, we could never really build anything bigger than what we currently have here. No, this this site is is full. This site is this site would be similar to our Highland site, uh, okay. as far as size of property, which you know is kind of landlocked, yeah, in which we say. had to per, we had to, if you remember at Highland, we had to purchase homes and tear down to build a a, um, a parking, parking lot. lot. Yeah, right, right. And so, and that's the same thing here. We we are completely surrounded by we are on a block, city block. Here. Right. So, okay, that's just some things I had some questions about. Well, then, we'll ask you to bring an updated timeline uh, ready to vote on it in September. I got two. Okay, excuse me, Mr. Phillips. I didn't see you. How much work? I don't want to add too much more work to you, but just because you used uh, the example of, you know, the capacity is one thing, but what's realistic to operate with is a different number. Is that something that you could just pull together without a whole lot of research or, or in-depth extra work? Because I'd kind of like to know that. I, will, I was looking at these this evening or this afternoon at home. I thought, well, wow, we really do have all this extra space here or there. But now hearing you say that, I think, well, it wouldn't I, be realistic. I, I think two, two things. One, um, specifically when you get to the middle schools and the high schools, um, one of the things we've talked to you about Spring Hill High School is the width of the hallways of the infrastructure and moving children. I know from having been at Cox that when the, the you know, the commission built Cox and Howell, not, not the school board. And one of the things that they did was they came in and they cut square footage as costs were going up and they narrowed the halls by about four feet. Um, so you can put kids down the hall, you just can't move when you get them into the hall. So, so that's one thing that, that's a realistic issue, whether it's an elementary up, um, is how do you phys you know physically move about the building and can you do that in an efficient and safe way the second thing and this is a real hurdle and i mentioned to you this back in the spring when we talked about capacity numbers i sent an email even after i talked to you guys the last time to to principals and i had all but two principals actually respond back i looked at it the other day i had it on a spreadsheet and and i said what are you what number are you comfortable with in your building? They range so far away from what we realistically think the building can hold that it is crazy. We had a high school that shot so low, and they said, we're cool with this number because we would like to keep our classes at 20 to 25. Well, we would all like to keep our <laughs> classes at 20. So, so I... I can I can go back and pull to you a number that we think is a good operational number, but it, I don't know what it'll be. I do know this in the past, and, and Mr. Lindsay, Mr. Beavers may have been around. Uh, I know Mr. Uh, Dudley would have been. We used to be given the rule that we wanted to operate buildings somewhere between 85 and 90 percent of the capacity that we determined. And that was so that over the course of the year, if you, if you had new neighborhoods open, if you saw growth in an area, you always were running about that 10%, 10 to 15 uh, on, on what you could absorb within the time. Uh, we're way below that at, at some schools right now. Spring Hill Middle is very low right now, but that's because we built Battle Creek. We know that those two schools are going to go up. Same thing with Spring Hill Elementary. It's probably going to fill back up much quicker you know, than, than some of the schools down here will. Um, so that's generally kind of what we used to operate on was somewhere between that 85 to 90 we were comfortable. Once we got over 90, we were starting to be uncomfortable. You can see that Baker, Brown, McDowell are the ones that are over 90 right now. All right, you don't need to give me any other information. That 85 to 90 percent, that's that's how I'll guide my decision making. One other last thing I want to mention is we're not just dealing with the emotions of closing a school um, and the families that that affects 
and once I get something in my head, I don't let go of it. I like your, your phrase, illusion of numbers, because we're going to have a whole county that voted for a property tax increase, or a sales tax increase, and I'm sitting here looking at news articles, the county mayor, the city of Columbia mayor, the head of the county commission, all mentioned that that sales tax was going to rebuild McDowell. So I think we're going to have to not only be gentle with the families, but we're going to have, what did I say, 5,600 citizens of Murray County who voted in, or voted, well, 6,000, that voted in favor of that, uh, going to be pretty mad. And I think that that's something we're going to have to navigate, not only, like I said, the families, but the public relations aspect of it, because all these people were saying, give us a sales tax, we're going to have you a new McDowell. And that's not going to happen. So I think uh, we've, not us, but a lot of people have been set up for um, disappointment in that regard. So thank you for all this information. That 85 to 90 percent number is, is very helpful. Thank you. Mr. Howe. So you mentioned capacity real quick on these elementary schools that you just mentioned that are at capacity. So when we shutter a school that has a capacity of 370, that has 348 students in it currently, what, what does that do to those schools? I, I think I mentioned to you last month that, that when, if you remove that school, and it's basically like throwing a rock into the pond and the mm -hmm. puddle goes out, because without getting into specifics, what you can, what you can see, and, and I didn't realize it until I went through the process of saying, okay, what does this really look like? It's in the dead center. Uh, of the elementary zones. And it's not in the center of Columbia. It's very close, but it is in the dead center of the elementary zones. And if you, what you think about, if you, its zone goes from Roland Fields over on Hatcher Lane to Roland Fields. It comes around, encompasses the CA campus, uh, runs around James Campbell um, on the Macedonia side. Not all the way to James Campbell, because some of those kids go to Riverside, but the Macedonia, the heart of it, and comes back around downtown. That's kind of the heart of the zone. Goes to the underpass on School Street, um, and, and right there uh, in behind South High. South High is its limit right there. So that's the that's the heart of that McDowell zone. And what you look at is when you take that that rock and you throw in there, and they spread out. Those kids naturally have to have to kind of move to the schools that are around them. The schools that are around them are Baker, Riverside, and Highland. Well, what does that mean? Baker's sitting at 98% capacity. That means that Baker kids have to make that move to open up space. So that's where you see your two largest space holders are Woodard and Howell. And, and they're on the outskirts, which in this case helps us tremendously because you threw the rock into the center and as you push out, you're pushing towards those schools that have space. Now, one of the things that we did as well was look at, um, and, and without getting into the specifics, Mount Pleasant Elementary comes into play with that because you're, you're rippling, you're pushing those kids out, and that's really what it does. They don't cluster way off. I mean, th that group will move probably in three units, and they'll move, you know, it's not like they're all being spread out and they'll never see each other. They're moving, but th they're moving in units. And that you throw that rock in there as it ripples out, that's what has to happen. So as you said, that 98% capacity at Baker means it's full. To free up kids to go to Baker means that Woodard, which is sitting at 79%, can pick up kids. And if you look, the big one in there is Howell. Howell's sitting at 62.3%. Uh, and we just emptied four classrooms at Howell. Uh, we worked with Miss um, Ventura. We housed equipment there. We housed uh, itinerant staff. We're actually in that process still. And we've moved those folks to um, those portables downtown. And we're utilizing that office space as office space and not utilizing class space as office space. I hate to say in anticipation of, of maybe mm -hmm. having to pick up kids, but in anticipation of maybe having to pick up kids. So then assuming we don't grow, mm -hmm. assuming that there's no construction in Columbia, we'll be okay. Mm -hmm. But as we all know, 
there are houses being built in every lot that can be found in Columbia. Yeah. So, so going forward, how, how does this play out? I mean, what are we going to do? So without getting into the weeds, you know we're always thinking ahead of y'all. I don't mean that the way that sounded, but we're always, <laughs> lo we're always looking down oh, the really? road. No. Um, we, we, two things, a lot of the growth is, is able to be filtered in some way to Howell because a lot of that growth is occurring in the current Riverside zone and the current Brown zone where we're seeing big growth in Columbia. Um, now, here's the other thing, and I'm falling back into transportation mode. Please know that Columbia goes to Spring Hill High School. Please know that when Spring Hill Middle School was built, it had a Columbia address, and they had to petition the state to move it to Spring Hill, and then the city took it in. Columbia goes to the, I mean, you know, it goes a long way, okay? The biggest growth we see is north of Bear Creek Pike, okay? That's Randolph Howe growth, that's Spring Hill Elementary growth. We're, we've identified where we think an elementary school would be, and, and I believe Mr. Hickman brought you guys at a retreat, kind of the order in which we thought buildings might pop up. Um, we think that high school is going to be the first one, but then you saw an elementary school, and you saw within that five-year window, I had two elementary schools listed, uh, and that is in their city of Columbia elementary schools. And please know that even if we had to go north of Bear Creek, and when I say nor north of Bear Creek, I'm thinking north of Speedway, okay, north of Burt Drive, probably somewhere on that, that west side of 31. In my mind, that's a Columbia school. I think a lot of citizens think that's a Spring Hill school. It's not. It's a Columbia school. Um, so, so you're right. If we don't grow, we're fine. We know that's not going to happen. The other thing that Mr. Hickman has asked us to start looking at is your, your fifth grade option uh, and, and what we would do with that. And then that, that becomes really tricky down the road. But, but those are things that we're looking at right now for down the road. And we're working with, we work constantly with the City of Columbia, with Mount Pleasant and Spring Hill, and then with the county on the maps and on where the growth is. Uh, we're still seeing the bulk of the growth up north. Uh -huh. That's still where not, that's still where sixty to sixty five percent of it is. We're seeing growth in Mount Pleasant. Um, we're seeing patterns change um, in some areas, but Columbia is starting to see a lot of growth, and we're going to see some growth on that opposite side of Columbia very soon. And that's my concern. Is so we're seeing so if our comfort level is ten percent. And I'm just looking at Columbia schools right now, and some of them are at or above or extremely close to that 10%. We're still looking at building schools. And, and we're still going to be in the business of building schools for quite some time. We are, and, and again, probably more than you want to know. Here's the big problem we have. We have little schools. Right. And, and that's, I know nobody likes to hear we have, li we have 300 and 400 students. School. We have little schools. They fill up really quickly. I love them. They're awesome. You go in Highland Park, you go in McDowell, you go in these small, they're wonderful. They are just little niches of, of, of heaven. But Baker's the same way. But if you look, we got big schools, and they're sitting empty because we're full in the little schools. And so as you have to approach that down the road, if you, if you had to address a, a larger or another school in the city of Columbia, you address it as a larger school so that that capacity comes. We know right now we just built an elementary school at $21.5 million. Uh, we think we can build one cheaper than that because we think we can redesign it and it not be what you just got and it can be a lot cheaper uh, and still have everything you want it to have. Um, but that's what we would have to do. We would have to build elementary schools that look more like Randolph Howell, that look more like Battle Creek, that look more like Marvin Wright or Woodard. And, and as you move forward, and I, and I don't mean, look, I'm, and, and look, you know me, I say things and then people say, you hate the little schools. I'm not saying that. But from an operational overview, it's cheaper to run the big schools, it's more efficient to run the big schools, and you put a lot of kids in them. On, a, on one footprint, um, and, and you can come in and do that. Uh, but yes, you're right. I mean, there's no way around it. There's no way around it, no matter what. You, there's going to have to be an elementary school built in the city of Columbia. If you leave McDowell open, there has to be an elementary mm -hmm. school built in the city of Columbia. 
There, there's no way around it. Mr. Moore. Two things. I don't know Mr. Fulbright left, and I wanted to comment to him, but uh, Mr. Howell, I appreciate you bringing that up because we can't forget that. This doesn't stop anything. I mean, it really, we're, we're kind of doing measures we have to do, but this doesn't stop the, the growth in the, the north side of Columbia, especially, is where it looks like. Um, one thing I will say on the capacity thing, and having gone through this, like, really, and he talks about getting into the weeds, um, we're, we're going to get even further into the weeds when we get into talking about how the it, it every time you move one piece, literally three more things move, and it is mind-blowing. But when you talk about capacity, um, Mr. Howe, I think you brought that up, too. Literally, you can, and I think he, uh, Mr. Perryman could back this up, you could put three principals and give them a school building and ask them to program it, and you will get three different capacity numbers based on how that individual principal programs that school. Widely different. Um, and that's one of the concerns I know I've had with when we look at the growth at Spring Hill High School and, and some of the things that look like they're at 90 percent. Um, you could very easily, I'm not, I'm not faulting that principal or anything else, but you could easily take another principal, put them in that same school, and all of a sudden you would have a number that was at 80 percent or 73 percent just because of how they would run their school. And that's that's a big variable that it's hard on a, on a board member for us to kind of manage that piece. That, that's difficult because I've been asking for solid, consistent numbers for six years now, and there's just I finally figured, figured out there's no way to get it. Uh, it's going to change every year depending on how that building is run, new state programs, how things are going. If you look at the elementary schools, you look at the pre-K numbers. I know that's something that we've moved around in the past. That radically can change what your capacity is in a building depending on where you decide to utilize pre-K. Um, so these are just moving targets and it's very frustrating. <laughs> While we're on this, okay, you know, I always, I'm throwing it in there. We would like to talk to you about doing what the counties around us, what Rutherford has done, what Williamson has done, what Wilson is doing, what these, what these Sumner has done. Find an elementary plan that you really like. And when we build an elementary school from now on, we don't design site-specific schools. Find a high school that you feel like we can build and we can, we can tool and we can program to the needs that you want, and then let's build that thing. And the next time we build it, we build it again. Do we, do we improve it? Do we know that we have to adjust it site to site? Yes, we know that. And I know we talk about Williamson, but if you go to Summit or you go to Nolansville or you go to Ravenwood, you go to these buildings, it's the same building. They just moved it around to make it look uh -huh. different for that school. You come in on one side, you come in on, on, the, on the right, or you come in on the left, or you come in in the middle, but it's the same basic thing. And what we've done, if you look across our buildings, they are all very site-specific. Or we went from one architect and then we changed and we went to another one um, and, and, you know, someone who had very specific um, wants and checks to meet. What we think we can do is start getting into the business of building a building, and I'm not just saying you build a, but that's what builders do with houses. You, you build a house that you get a plan that works and you build it over and over and over because people know that plan works. And we think we can do that, and we would love for you to be part of that conversation in programming and tooling a building so that not only this board, but boards in the future know when you start looking at building a, we're building a middle school, you already know what goes into building a middle school. You know what it kind of functions, how it works. We've already talked through the details and you hone it in and make it more what you want as you go over time. Um, and, and that's what we think has to happen because we're the 12th largest system in the state. You know, people don't think that, but we are. And with the growth that's coming, it's not slowing down. And, you know, that, that's what a lot of folks don't realize is that the, it's not going to slow down. We're going to build more schools, and we're going to build things in the future. We just have to have a plan and be very uh, diligent and very um, mindful of what you want that to look like as we move forward. And then that takes so much heat off of you. And the big thing that we fight, and you guys know this, are the inequities across our district. Santa Fe needs an auxiliary gym. Santa Fe's needed an auxiliary gym for the 22 years that I've been in Murray County. It's been said every year. The inequities that we have, what we have to do moving forward is start saying we got a uniform plan for these different sites, and when you get a building, you're getting what the others got. 
and we move forward with that. So that's just a plug from us. That makes life a little bit easier. It's a lot of work, but it makes life easier on us in the long run. And I think it makes it easier on you, and it, it meets the needs of the children. That's not to abandon the sites we have now, and that's not to throw stones at them and say, oh, these sites aren't great, because they all are. They all have their characteristics and their nuances. But as you move forward, how do we address new sites? Okay, thank you. This has been a really good discussion. Um, I assume that we want to bring this back to the board meeting, and you will update the plan. So that You want an updated timeline? That's right. Okay, okay. we'll do it. All right, moving on then uh, is policies. I think the policies it's posted. You skipped one thing. Oh, no. oh thermal imaging. Oh, my gosh. And I brought this before you. Mr. Hickman uh, and Doug and I have been have been speaking about this, and we've actually started school. We wanted to get it to you before school. You remember back in the summer I, I talked to you about some thermal imaging cameras that we tested out at Central High School that can take large numbers of temperatures at one time. Mr. Hickman asked me to look into these systems and see what we could do for our larger schools. Uh, we identified the six largest schools and we got pricing for those. However, the price is the same no matter what because we utilized the cameras that already exist within our buildings. So it's not coming in and adding a, a lot of new hardware. It's a lot of software updates that come into. So what you've got here are um, just a proposal, and, and the one I'm looking at is not flipping the way I want it to, um, but it is a proposal to add thermal imaging capabilities to those six sites and I'm going to have to open up the actual quote because it's not not flipping the way I want. I believe the quote is around $66,000. And if you will give me just a moment, and I am so sorry that I thought that would open in there and it did not. Yeah. So, and you see the breakout of what it is per site. So, in discussions with Mr. Hickman, we thought that this would be something to bring forth that would be helpful with the larger schools. It is something that we would have forever. Uh, so if we ran up on this sort of situation again, these buildings would have these capabilities. Uh, and it is, like I said, mainly just a software update. Uh, so we're bringing that to you just for, for discussion and consideration. Oh, and there it is down there. Um, but I will tell you, um, there's nowhere identified in the budget for this funds. So this would have to be a fund balance uh, purchase. But, but it's a one-time purchase. It correct? would be a one-time purchase, okay. yes, ma'am. All right, any discussion? Mr. Moore. Yeah. I, I, man, I'm a tech guy, and this sounds really neat, but I just don't see that this is something we need to be engaged in right now. I just, I just don't see the benefits when I could come up with about a, I don't know, art <clears throat> somewhere else that we could spend if we're going to spend this money right now. And I'm just not seeing a benefit for this part. So... That's where I'd be on it. Mr. Howe. I'm inclined to agree with Mr. Moore. And however, um, watching our staff out there with their, you know, the, the guns and everything, the uh, temperature scanners and everything, and, and it's really good right now. But it's also nice outside in the morning. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how happy they're going to be when it's 23 degrees outside, um, standing out there scanning our kids. So uh, it might be something to consider, but, I, I mean, at this point, everything's running pretty smoothly as far as scanning temperatures go. And please know this cost would be uniform no matter the site. That's why we only char chose the larger sites because they do handle such volume. It would be the same to put it into Baker. So the cost is there. Any other discussion? Ms. I, Reaver? I have just one okay. thing real quick. I can't but see you it looks like, I'm sorry. That's, that's okay. It looks like it's just one single device camera to detect it. I mean, every school we have has multiple entry points, I think, but um, that's one concern I, I would have with this. And also, you're still going to have a person or a couple people that has to monitor this as people come through to check these temperatures, I assume, right? Or so, so the good thing is, one, we are adding ahead, but we can convert some of our existing entryway cameras to operate on this system as well. 
Okay. Uh, you know, we've spent quite a bit of money in the last couple of years getting cameras up to date. Yes, you have to have someone to monitor it. The good, the good thing about this system is I could monitor it from, from wherever. Um, some of the ones that we looked at from other companies, you had to physically stand behind a little podium with the camera and you had to move the camera. This one, the camera can, is, is fixed. It is a camera that's there and it could be monitored by someone with a laptop sitting at the door. They don't have to be there all the time. So we, we looked at, if we were looking at thermal imaging, how could we do this and it be the most efficient and not be not be a big piece of hardware that you have and then a year from now it's just sitting in a corner because this actually just ties into our existing cameras. And so um, that, that's why we looked at this. And um, Systems is a, a company we normally work with and they have this on a, a, um, a statewide bid. So that, that's why we brought this specific system to you. Mr. Howe. Just, just a clarifying question. So it uses our existing cameras, so literally it doesn't matter what port of entry they enter. They, it, we're monitoring it from all? I, it, yes, but it, they have to determine which cameras you know, within the system you have to set which ones you want to actually monitor that. It's, it's the brains of the system. Okay. You have to change not the whole head, no. Okay. Some of the newer ones you don't have to change the head. Some of the existing older ones you do. What we did when we converted the cameras, some of the cameras that we use are still old black and white cameras. They've just been pulled into our digital system. Some of them are brand new cameras, and obviously the newer the camera, the more functions it has. The camera that we put in now, the, the software packages you can buy with it are crazy as to what they can do. It's kind of like a kind of like buying a tractor. An 80 horsepower and 120 horsepower has the same engine, just the computer tells it it's different. Right. So the heads of the cameras are somewhat the same way now. Any other discussion, Mr. Fulbright? I'm kind of intrigued by this. I kind of think it's a neat something. And I think you're, you hit it head on. When it gets to be 25 degrees outside, you're not going to warn a lot of people out there. Is there a way, or I, I know the bid is for six schools, but is there a way to get it to only three schools and test it? And if it's something we don't like, then we're only out that way three schools worth of money. Yes. But if it's something that we do find to be a benefit, or would they let us test it at once? And that the price you see is fixed. So whatever you want, if you wanted to, if you wanted to buy one, test it's it at 60, one, 6, 000, or, then or, that's fine. Yeah, we can do that. Well, that's what I'm asking. It's 11. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's what I was it's asking. A, it's the same price when per school. When you said school. fixed, I thought... No, no, no. The, it's, a, it's a fixed cost per right. school. Right, okay. Per school. Per and school. All, of our, all of our sites are on the Civision Line okay. system now. So it would be something that eventually, if you chose to, you could expand into even this building and central office and the tech department everywhere has got the same system now. Okay, I'd, I'd like to say discuss it just a little bit more just to give it a... A try. I mean, I think there is going to be some benefit to it this upcoming year, no matter what. But yeah, I think it deserves some more discussion. Why don't we put it on the uh, agenda for the board meeting, and we can discuss it further and uh, see what you all want to do. Uh, as to do it for one, two, three, four, or six schools, we'll just uh, bring it to a discussion and a vote. Okay. Um, policies, final adoption, that's a policy that we propose uh, changing the board meeting time. Uh, I think we want a motion in there to say we waive the 30-day posting of that policy since we've already uh, hoping we. I think Shirley's helped make out a calendar and everything based on that. But uh, so, is there any discussion about it, or uh, can I put it on consent? That's true. Okay, sorry. Right. Okay. Um, there aren't any posted policies. So I'm moving to other business, instructional low bids. Uh, the first one is bid number 21-001, RFP for Adaptive Online Literacy Program for grades 3 to 12. I'm pitch hitting for Scott tonight, so I'll try to... Um, <laughs> I try to address this. Um, this is a um, reading program that would be used at 
Whitthorn, Cox, and Brown Elementary Schools. It is being purchased with title funds. Um, beyond that, I don't know if there's a lot I can tell you about it. <laughs> Any discussion, then we will move that to consent. Next is uh, bid number 21-002, additional SPED contract, and here she comes. Do you want to talk about it? It is a contract for a school psychologist. Um, we have had four postings for a school psychologist um, all summer. I was able to hire one full-time. Uh, this is a contract, or I'm sorry, I was able to hire two full-time, so I have two open. Uh, this is one that will serve Battle Creek Middle School. Is it's there any discussion? And this is a budgeted, this is budgeted, right? Absolutely. Okay, Okay. thank you. Then, then uh, seeing no lights, then we'll move that to consent as well. The next one is a title one also, and I guess that's from Scott as well. Yes, ma'am. This is actually with our CARES Act funding, and it is the remote hotspots and um, usage um, for six months. I think it was, I looked at the number we were purchasing, about 150, I think, is what we're looking to purchase initially just to see how it works and go from there. I, I kind of did too because where where am I looking at the wrong one? I'm sorry. <laughs> Four point one point three. Please forgive me. Okay, all right. Uh, so we'll put that on consent. Next one is the Teach Town Special Ed Program. Again, this is a budgeted purchase uh, in my federal budget. Uh, this is a program that. Uh, works with um, applied behavior analysis. It is uh, a cognitive and um, it, is, it is both a cognitive program and a social emotional learning program. Um, I had budgeted this long before I realized I was going to need so many programs for remote learners, but the beauty of this is that I was able to add um, several PD sessions for parents in this bid. So that I can send them out to par I can send the actual p uh, professional development and learning opportunities out to parents, uh, so that remote learners can also access this program. Okay. Seeing no lights, we'll move that to consent. The, now I believe we're on the one you were talking about. So yes, ma'am. Uh, I apologize for that. That's okay. So this uh, would be our um, remote um, my five devices for our remote learners purchased through the CARES Act funding. Okay. Uh, seeing no lights, we'll put that also on consent. Wait a minute, I lost my place here. Purchase of smart music, and Scott was not able to put that. Uh, he got in touch with me today. You know he's been out because of the uh, passing of his brother, so he uh, asked me could he put the uh, attachment on today. I realized that was late, but you understand that. So is there any discussion about the purchase of smart music? And th but that's a fund balance purchase, so yes, please, Mr. Hickman. All right, this is the program that the uh, band teachers have specifically asked for. Um, what this is is, and now the choir teachers also have jumped on to this. This is a program that they can use, specifically a program they can use with the remote learners. Mm -hmm. And this is a program many of them use anyway from year to year and they are asking us to uh, consider using this. Um, they have came together as a collective to ask for this, and uh, I wish I could tell you specifically what's in smart music, but uh, I'm not sure. They were here at the, work, I mean, at the board meeting last month, and uh, I, I know several of us got emails about it as well, so uh, this would be a fun balance purchase, but it sounds like one that they could utilize, uh, and, and they, they feel pretty strongly about how beneficial it would be. I just got a quick question. Uh, Mr. Fulbright. S since this is relating to a remote option, would it not be eligible to some of the money that's been distributed? I think the challenge with that is we had to program that money before, okay. and, and we just don't have any available funds to All do right. that. Okay. All right. I was looking at the attachment just real quick. 
it does say the account code, and usually Scott will say, hey, you all get us a budget amendment on it. So I don't know if this was one of the ones that Leanne actually brought up at the work session last month when she presented the books. She said she had some extra money in the music, and I think you all had already approved it. I think it's only on the agenda because it's a high-ticket item, and everything that's more than 10000 has to be approved by the board. So I think it is. Already funded. I'll check. I'm thinking. I'm pretty sure I'll email Leanne in the morning and check. I don't think we're going to need the amendment. I think she said she, they had said at the meeting since I sat, I was sitting next to her that day that they were going to use the extra funding that they had left in the textbook line. So you wouldn't actually be using fund balance. So I'm pretty sure that was said, um, but I'm going to check with Leanne and make sure since she, neither of them are here today. Yeah, I will. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, I. Are there any objection to leaving it on consent, or do you want to leave it on? Okay. All righty. Then let's move on. Um, now we're in uh, 4.2.1. So you're saying you're moving it to consent? Mm -hmm. okay. No. As long as it is not coming from fund balance, I'm fine with that. If, if that could be clarified well, for sure. Let's just let's just put it on. Uh, new I'm day. texting her right now, so okay. if I mean, she gets back to me, I'll let you know. To find out. I mean, that's that's my that's my only thing is if if it is fund balance request, I would like it to be separate. And and I do want to say that Leanne is usually always here, but Doug requested somebody from instruction be at the uh, yes. meeting tonight with Doug just in case questions came up about the textbooks. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to move on, and then if you get an answer, that'd be great. Uh, if not, we'll put it on new business. Uh, bid the 4.2.1 is class link and annual site licenses. Is there anyone that can talk about that, or is there any discussion? Basically, this is the software package that we're using to. It integrates every single software that we have and utilizes a tool called OneSync, which actually the teachers are really, it takes all these different software, syncs their passwords. Uh, so a lot of the remote learners, it's a launch pad, all, not only for students, but for parents. You can actually follow along. We add Chris Seal, actually, if requested, we add software to it in a very secure way. We actually got rid of some other software packages that do with HR creating accounts and um, attendance clerks putting in things. Every night it syncs, creates their accounts. Now, obviously, there's some challenges. If you have something wrong on when it's entered, it's going to be wrong the next day. We've been working through some of those things where parents say, I can't log in because what we assume their login information is may or may not be true. We have to go look it up, but uh, it's, it's really an awesome tool. It's something that came from uh, doing a proof of concept at McDowell with the teachers. And the fund, it's... Uh, we, yeah, it's funded. All right. All right. It's in our budgeted for this. All right. Then seeing no lights, we'll put that on consent. Next is the Lightspeed Relay subscription. Yeah, this is uh, this light speed relay is actually our uh, it's our filtering software for devices that go home. The federal government requires us that if we send a device home, it has to have some kind of content filtering on it. We had we had some uh, previous vendors uh, with us renewing and looking. We said, hey, we're going to go look at everybody, and uh, they actually stepped up, and uh, we're we're really satisfied with the with the the, the program they they're offering. Consent. Okay. Oh, you have an answer. Yes, ma'am. Um, she said that it was not something that she brought to you all at that last meeting, but it, with the savings that we had from the, tech, the ELA textbook adoption and spreading that out over two years, she feels that we have plenty of funds to be able to cover this okay. without going into fund balance. All right, then we'll put that on consent. Thank you. Uh, next is the wireless. I, X, oh, am I, have I missed a light speed relay subscription? No, we just did that. Yes. I'm sorry. Wireless access point. Um, that's you too, isn't it? Yeah, I got the last three. Basically, with uh, trying to get some outside school coverage, especially with vehicles and uh, no contact visits and things like that, we moved some of the access points to the outer part of the buildings, especially the front by the office. And this is to backfill and to give some additional coverage in some spots. It's obviously not filling. We every year we encourage anybody. If you have any Wi-Fi issue or any blank spot, please let us know. Uh, we did. We did actually, and I'll probably be. We we we're going to file for Category 2 E-rate money, which would have helped us revamp our entire network, which we did approximately five years ago. Mm -hmm. That money, obviously, with the things that happened and everything getting cut, it was close to $400,000. We had to match to get like 2.2. But uh, we're still going to this year to do the best we can, and uh, we can apply for the money. 
but we don't have to take it. So come December time, we'll be doing some numbers. The federal government says you can apply, and if you guys, we bring it to you, and we don't have the money to match it, we don't. But ultimately, uh, this right now is just going to kind of fill some spots and get some front door coverage for some schools. Okay. Seeing no lights, we'll put it on consent. Once again, it's budgeted, so right. Okay. Um, okay, and uh, last on the list here is the SRO MOU. Yes, ma'am. We hoped today to have a signed MOU for you. The Sheriff's Department had a little issue over the weekend, and the Sheriff wasn't able to, right. to be um, available to do that today. We will have a signed uh, copy both by the, the Sheriff's Department and the school system um, by the board meeting. The, the only real change is we went in and, and worked with our insurance company and worked through Jake and added specific language as to what liabilities the county takes on and the school system takes on because we do have county employees who their 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 assigned place of work is within our buildings and so we just kind of added some language that was recommended by the insurance companies and you can see all of that there uh, I assume we just leave it on new business then correct okay I know you are are that's the last thing we got right here. But let me just say one more thing before we leave. This is Denny Beaver's last time to have his punch his light button and get somebody to finally see it, right? <laughs> it's, too late now. it's too late now. That's right. But I just want to personally thank you because when I came on the board, Denny kind of took me under his wing. He got me places, and, and he was sitting beside me in many meetings, and I totally ignored him, and I apologize for that. But he's been a great board member. We're going to miss you. But we're going to honor you next month, so we'll see you. There's going to be a reception before next month's meeting at 5 o'clock. Uh, so come. The new board members will be honored as well as those outgoing board members as well. So with nothing else to do, this meeting's adjourned.